Okay, I just hit record. Let me just say some brief words, and then we could I can edit something out too if we need to. But hey, this is Stefan Kinsella, um, talking to um, uh, a libertarian from Las Vegas named Dennis. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about IP. Um, let me just explain what what happened. So on Twitter, I don't remember how it came up, but some anti IP comment was made by me or someone, and Dennis weighed in with pro IP comments, and I tried to uh, argue with them and. I just said, look, let's just talk about it. So um, that's the purpose of this. And I, I'm going to let you talk a lot, but I, I'm going to set it up and try to ask you some questions or see where see where you are. Uh, so I see you have a Libertarian Party of Nevada hat. I have that exact hat. Uh, a friend, uh, you're not the one who gave it to me. No, someone else gave it to me. Uh, no. I went to uh, I was at I was at Reno and uh, me too. And um, I was at. Um, I think it was not Reno. I think it was Las Vegas. I was at, and I, I went to. Um, no, it was it was some convention. I was anyway. There were some Las Vegas guys there, and I got invited to their house, and he gave me the hat. Ah. So I, I wear it around. I was wearing it around Houston, but I quit wearing it because <laughs> everyone assumes I'm from Las Vegas. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're in. You're obviously a libertarian, right? Oh yes. Okay. Most definitely. Um, or what kind of libertarian are you? Like, are you minarchist, anarchist, minarchist? Okay, you're a minarchist. I'd say yeah. I'd say minarchist. That's what we call these mini. We call you a mini status then, but that's okay. Um, I'll take it. And uh, are you like sort of natural rights type or consequentialist or utilitarian or like who, who do you like? Rand or Rothbard um, or Mil Milton Friedman, Ron Paul? Who, who's who's your guy? Ron Paul, you know Ron Paul, um, Rothbard. You know I I read a little bit. I mean I, I'll be honest, I'm not like deep. You know, in the you know, like I have, you know, I haven't read all the all the different guys. Right. You know, right? Um, like I said, I'm not deep into the philosophies. I got it. That's know? fine. That's um, fine. That's fine. And listen, I I want to. A lot of people think I'm kind of a an asshole, and I'm really hard <laughs> on people. But I never mind people that disagree with me, and I never mind people that ask questions, and I never mind people that are not even they're not even intellectuals. That's fine. W what I don't like is when people make um, confident assertions about something that's really bad, and that they don't mm -hmm. know anything about it. Like it's. It's better to just ask questions or, or say, well, how would this work or what's the right way or what should I go read? You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. you, so being a little bit humble. Um, so that's kind of my – the reason I, I'm kind of sharp with people sometimes is like when they when well, they just make an assertion. Now, if there's someone who studied it deeply and they still disagree with me and they make an assertion, well, then I, I respect the fact that they at least know what they're talking about. They just come to a different conclusion than me, you know, like Richard Epstein or someone like that. Right. Um, but um, OK, so let me ask you this. Um do you, if you're a libertarian, a minarchist libertarian, you, you you believe in some form of nat of natural right, or you believe in property rights, correct? Yes, I believe in property rights. You know, I believe that, you know, someone does have you know rights to their to their own property. Correct. But at the same time, I'm, and I hate to use this word, being as a you know as a Mises caucus, I'm a bit of a pragmatist. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I, I think property property rights are pragmatic. Actually, they're 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 a practical solution to a real problem, which is the problem of conflict over scarce resources. Right. I just I honestly disagree. Where I disagree is is that um only physical items are scarce. Well, let's let's not go there yet. Let's hold on a second before okay. we go there. Uh, <laughs> let, 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 let me let me let me see where we have common ground uh, first. Right. Um, okay. Um. Would you kind of agree that um, most rights are um, – the, the rights that we libertarians support are basically negative rights? Like it's it's a right that other people not do something to you, and that positive rights generally are welfare rights, which which gives you a claim on someone else doing something for you, which is which 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 undercuts rights. In other words, if I have a right to my body and my my car, all you have to do is just not take it. Right. But no, if I, I have a duty, I, if I have a duty to education and I mean, if I have a right to education and, and, and health care, you have to provide it to me, but with taxes or something like that. So that would be <clears> a <throat> claim over your property. So would you agree with that, basically, that we oppose positive rights in that sense? 
Right. In, in that in that sense, yes. You know, I mean, I, I do not agree that one should say we have we have a right to health care because then that would force someone to provide that health care. Right. Right. So so what I'm getting at is a lot of liberals or, or kind of moderates would say, well, we believe in property rights. But we also believe in welfare rights. So they think you can add on to the set of negative rights. You can add positive rights onto it because they don't understand that the positive rights undercut the negative rights. Like to the extent you have a right to to um, to healthcare, that takes mm-hmm. away some of my rights because I have to be taxed to to pay for it. And so I'm mm-hmm. going to explain later. Uh, the analogy is. When you say you believe in rights and physical things, but you believe in other rights and other things too that are not physical, what you're doing is exactly the same thing as someone who says, well, I believe in negative rights, but I also believe in positive rights. Because when you grant positive rights, you take away from negative rights, and whenever you recognize rights in something that's not a physical, scarce, tangible, material resource, it takes away from those rights because uh, uh, they're in conflict with each other. Um, And I'll I'll explain that later, but um, (laughs) let me ask you this. So. As a libertarian, we, we have some common ground, the non-aggression principle, property rights, things like that. All right. And you you just spout off on this list, oh, well, I believe in intellectual <clears throat> property. Now you start giving reasons for it, like, oh, how are producers gonna uh, how are artists gonna make a profit? How are inventors gonna make a profit? All that stuff. But the first question would be when you say that you believe in 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 intellectual property rights. Would you agree that the burden of proof is on you to number one, define what you mean, and number two, to explain why we have those rights and why it's compatible with our rights? Do you agree that the burden of proof is on you? Well, of course. If I say if I say I believe something, then okay. I I think that yes, the, the okay. burden of proof. Well, then is let me ask me. you: the, What do you mean by intellectual property rights? What I mean is this: is someone should have the product of their mind to be able to be protected. In a way that gives them, you know, uh, you know, cover um, from someone, especially using their, in you know, uh, their intellectual property for profit. That's okay, the, so that's but but you see, that's not a but but that's that's not a definition of what the of what the rights are. I mean, you know, patent law and copyright law don't say what you just said. Patent law and copyright law say that someone cannot copy um, I that. an invention. That's, it's not. It doesn't say product of your mind and all this stuff. So that's not right. What, that's what I mean by by product of your mind. So that's what, that's, so do you basically mean the existing American legislated patent and copyright law? That's what you think is, yeah. is legitimate. No, no. So you so you, I, I, so I, I you'd think, be, would think, you be okay with abolishing the patent and the copyright system? No. So, you, so which one is it? Are you in favor of it, or are you opposed to it? <laughs> I, I see, that thing is, is you're going to extremes, from one to the other. Well, what you know? What, do you want to reform it? What What do you want to yes. do? Okay, so what's your yeah. ideal IP system? Um, one, what's, what's wrong with the current law? Is my question. If well, you don't like one, it, what's wrong with it? Well, for, um, let me go there. I'll get there. <laughs> uh, for one, the Extending IP rights beyond death. It's That's just, okay. Extending the IP rights beyond death. But so, what if you have a, a patent that lasts for seventeen years, a fixed term? It's not exactly that, but it's roughly that. Um, so, if you if you're ninety years old and you invent something and you have a patent and you die two years later, you think the well, patent should uh, expire when you die? Yep. Yep. Okay. Do you think that that might give an incentive to someone to bump you off so they can start competing yeah, with you? Yeah, I trust me. Actually, when I when I when I was talking about that on Twitter, I actually thought about that. <laughs> you know, that could actually you know create a kind so of so you're just you're kind of wing, so you're winging it as we're talking. You don't really have a system worked no, out in your I mind. Do. Okay, I I do. Okay, I'm just what? saying I did I did you know when we were talking about that it it entered my mind that with it you know being a you know. Ending at death, yes, that could incentivize someone to to knock off the inventor. You know, is that likely? I guess it, it depends. It on could how many be zeros. for for some patent well, inventions. I think it could be very likely. Yeah, I actually. mean, it de- depends on how many zeros are involved. You know, I mean, so yes, I do that. I do think that that could be a thing, but 
I don't think that IP should be extend beyond the death of the creator because his his descendants had no hand or mind in creating that intellectual property. Yeah, but I mean, th think how arbitrary that is. I mean, so let's imagine a guy invents something, and he he sells the patent to a company for ten million dollars. Okay, now if he dies the next day, he can still leave that ten million to his descendants, can't he? Right, but then he also at, at the time at that time no longer owns the patent. I mean, no, but, the, I, but honestly, no, but the, no, no. He, but the point is, whether he leaves the patent to his heirs, which has a valuable has a value, or he leaves the money he got from selling the patent to his heirs, it, I mean, it makes now you're artificially incentivizing someone to hurry up and sell their patent so that they can leave something to their heirs. And on the other hand, also, you know, you're treating people differently based upon their life expectancy because if I'm a young guy or if I'm a very old guy and I have the no. same invention, hold on, listen. Mm -hmm. If I if I sell that patent to a company or license it to someone, it's going to have more value if I'm younger because the company that buys it from me knows that it might expire in a year or two if I'm very old. So they're going to pay me less for it. So now right, if you're an older I'm inventor, not, you're penalized. But see, I'm not treating anybody different based on their age okay the law the, the law would be the same across the books for everybody so it's you know it doesn't matter if you're 90 or nine you know okay. um so <clears throat> are, are you aware of what the copyright term is right now for copyright i believe it's life plus 70 Life of the author plus seventy, so it's generally over a hundred years old in in many cases. Right, which I don't, I like I said, I don't agree with. And so, what would you, what would the, so you think there should be a fixed term for copyright and patent, and no. it should, and and it should expire upon death? There, there you go. But it's not a fixed term, you know. It's on right. death, so it could be twenty years, it could be two years. Well, that's fixed. I guess if you look at it. No, I mean what 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 do you so what should the terms what should the term of of a patent be in your in your in life? Your, oh, so if I if I invent something when I'm 20, it lasts for say 80 years maybe? Potentially. So it lasts so it, it lasts your entire life is what you're saying. Because your mind is cuz your the mind is the one that created it. Okay. But generally you're in favor of the copyright and patent system. You just think that they should be um the terms should be it, modified. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe, like I said, I believe that someone, like, for example, the example I used was, say I invent something, I spend 20 years, right, mm -hmm. testing and retesting and recalibrating and everything like that until I have invented mm -hmm. transparent steel. Yeah. Okay. Nobody else has come up with it. Nobody else has thought of it. It's only mine. Yeah. And then someone comes up behind me and basically copies it or whatever, re reverse engineers it, so yeah. on and so forth. They whatever. they learn they learn from you. Yeah. You taught them something. No, I didn't I didn't teach them anything. Yeah, you did. You taught them something by giving by put making something public. You pub you made your steel publicly available so they could so you taught them. No. In fact, you're probably you're probably going to have brochures saying, "Hey, I'm the inventor of this new transparent steel. Come take a look. It's better than other steel. Why don't you come buy it?" You're going to have brochures and magazine articles, and you're mm -hmm. going to be you're going to be that's teaching people. So, anytime you buy KFC, they're teaching you the eleven herbs and spices. Uh, if it's possible to reverse engineer, it, yes, they are. But that's the thing is, is nobody has. Well, it's that's, actually, that's actually, I think that's actually a myth. I think you could actually Google right now what they are. I think, and people know, people actually know what they are. I think they don't. But that's the thing is, they they get they. There's lots of guesses out there. But that's not intellectual property, of, by the way. That that's a trade secret. They're just keeping information secret. I mean, but it's it's the, in the, in the same realm. Well, you you're, you're assuming that it's possible to reverse engineer this steel or. Um, you know, a lot, lots of inventions. As soon mm -hmm. as you know that something is possible, then you can figure out pretty easily how to do it. Like if we knew right. that transparent steel was possible, then scientists would say, "Oh, I, I didn't know that was possible." And then they would they would say, "Okay, that must be done one or two ways," and then they'll, they'll they'll quickly figure it out. I mean, right. if you and figured so, it out, they could too. So you right. are and, teaching and, them in a in a sense. 
Well, I mean, you're, you're letting them know it's possible, that you're, but you're not teaching them you know, the formula because, I mean, as well, when you file, actually, when you file a patent, you are teaching them because you're, you're, you're publishing how to make it in the patent. Right, but that's when you file a patent because you're filing a patent because you know it is protected. Correct. That's, it's called, that's actually the patent bargain. The patent bargain is that we, mm -hmm. the government, will give you a 17-year limited monopoly on this idea if you disclose to everyone how to do it. So that so that right. when the monopoly expires, everyone else is free to use it and start competing with you. Then that's the patent bar. Right. It gives, basically it's giving you. It's like it's like listen, okay, you've you've basically done this thing that nobody else has done, okay, and then we're going to say okay for for a little while because it, you know it's 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 I mean I guess it's almost a I guess it would almost be like a reward system. Because you know you basically put all this into it. Yeah, yeah. So don't, I, I, don't you see that? That's the. I mean, the government does that also with government funding of science. They they give money to people to encourage them to do things, to reward them, to incentivize them to do things. I, I would assume well, you're yeah, against I mean, that. I assume you're against the government taxing me and you to fund science, like the National Institute for Science, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I, you're breaking up. I mean, I do believe that yes, all all taxes are theft. Okay, so if but if the government can't incentivize in innovation in that way, why can they incentivize it by granting because monopolies? Because there's so there's so there's so many, you know, private co companies out there. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I so what? think that, you know, and the reason why there's so many private companies out there is. Because they know that if they invent something, they actually can get a return on investment. They don't know that. All they know, is they, all they know is they can maybe stop a competitor. Potential. They can well, stop no, they a competitor. A and they can well, only no, stop I... a competitor if they can afford to enforce the patent. So if you're a small company and you invent something, even if you patent it, um, what are you going to do if Apple starts competing with you? You're going to sue Apple. Apple's going to hit you with ten million dollars of of, of uh, legal fees. Uh, you know, I mean, the, right, these patents, like these said, patents I, actually I, help the big companies. You do realize that they don't help small which companies. Is why, like I, which is why I said I think that a lot of these patent laws, you know, should be reformed. You know, I think a lot of our laws should be reformed to be okay. You know, but so you, you, you're you're you're, you're more simple. Your, your proposal is a unique one. I've never heard that one before, and I've heard a lot of a lot of. Stupid IP ideas. I mean, you realize that the ideas for reforming the patent system. Stupid. I'm just well, saying. Well, they're stupid. They're stupid because there's no there's no basis. But you just made it up. I mean, th th there are other proposals like to take the 17 year patent term and the uh, and the life of the author copyright term. Some people say, oh, wait, we should the the copyright term should be um, 14 years extendable once, like it was in the beginning of the country. Okay, that's arbitrary, but it's something. Uh, and some people say that uh, um, the patent system should have um, um, different terms for different technologies, like something that's – like like software should maybe seven years instead of 15 or whatever or se instead of 17 because it's a different type of it, – it advances so rapidly. So some people think you should have different terms, uh, or the terms should vary based upon the probability that someone else would have independently invented it, uh, or some libertarians believe that… The term should be perpetual; should last forever, like Lysander Spooner and, and Galambos. Yeah, I know. Right? I, I I read your, um, uh, your your article. So so th there's uh, everyone has a different proposal. What makes yours mm -hmm. the right one? What's what's your argument for I, the life of the author, and that's it? Um, because like I said, it's because nobody else beyond that. Had you know that the the brain of the person who came up with that idea, yeah, is no more. So what? No, like I said, I mean, yeah, technically you could put you know put a, a brain in a jar or whatever, but that's you know. Yeah, but what's 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 the brain existing have to do with how long the rights should be? Because, um, I mean, you like you realize the transistor, for example, and and there's lots of things that have been invented, <laughs> like the light bulb. There were mm -hmm. multiple people working on the same thing at the same time, and. And and one of them happens to get there first, but others are right on their heels. 
you know, the calculus was invented by Leibniz and Newton at the same time. Marginal utility was invented at the same time in economics by Menger and Walras and uh, Jevons at the same time. I mean, lots right, of but things. Those are, those are things that are, are, you know, like, I mean, listen, they're not like, patentable. They're not patentable. I'm just giving an I'm giving right. example. There's lots of things you know. that are like light bulb, airplane. Um, the point is, if I get a patent on the light bulb and there's other guys right behind me, if I hadn't existed, they would have invented it two years later. It was it was going to come. So if I right. get a patent on it for the next 80 years of my life, I've got a monopoly on something that everyone would have had for free. You know, It would have been in, in the public domain if I had just hadn't patented it. Like it's unfair for it to last mm -hmm. for 80 years because it would have been invented by someone else even so if I hadn't it, done what it. Only, what if it only lasts for six years? Or two years. Exactly. The point is, the longer the term is, the more you start running into the unjustness of and preventing also, someone who could have independently invented it from using. So, from using so it. let's say, say you invite, invite, in, invite, invent the light bulb, right? <clears throat> now, if I remember correctly, if I remember correctly, the first light bulbs were you had a wax filament. I think it was um, – I think it was um, – Or a paper it was, filament? Uh, it was bamboo or something. It was – it was it was shit. Yeah, and and, and, then, and and then when they put it – they then they realized if you have to put it in a vacuum and then use tungsten or whatever. Right, and so that's the thing is, is that new invention is then patentable. Yes. Okay. Anytime, you know, I, you, but it's I, but it's I, unjust. I, it's it's patentable because that's what the law says. But it's unjust because you know, Edison's competitor is about to do the same thing. Why can't he use the light bulb that he invents? Just because Edison did it a day earlier. Now here's now here's the thing is, I I know that. At least my – I'll be honest, my limited knowledge on patent law – okay, I'm not a patent lawyer like you um, or an IP lawyer you know, like yourself. So you don't have, I to, will you say, don't have to rub it in. Don't, 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 <laughs> don't, don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to criticize me like that. <laughs> well, you know what they say, right? You know, call call me an call, engineer. Don't call me a lawyer. What do, you, what, do you, what do you call a lawyer at the bottom of the ocean? A good start, yeah. There you go. <laughs> You know why sharks don't eat lawyers, right? Professional courtesy. There we go. <laughs> how do you, how can you I, tell when a lawyer is lying? These lips are moving. Yeah. Same way with a politician. It's true. <laughs> so no, I, like I said, I, I I will admit I I, I don't have as, the depth of knowledge in IP law that you do. Um, so I, I correct me if I'm wrong. Um, patent law, I mean, could ding someone even for copying somewhat something and using it themselves wait say again patent law like if i if i build my own light bulb yeah. right that is an exact copy of say edison's back then doesn't have to right? be an exact copy as long as it as long as it's similar enough to the way the patent claims it then you then you can't make it you can't make it use it or sell it Right, and that's even for personal use. If yes, not, if, if I'm 100%. Aware. Okay. It's got nothing to do with whether it's commercial or not. Right, and – but correct me if I'm wrong. And by the way, even if you invented it first – so let's say you invent the light bulb in your garage, but you don't right, tell no. anyone. So you're lighting up your house with these light bulbs, but you don't tell anyone because you're a, a miserable, misanthropic bastard. And you want to have the – you want to have a special thing no one else has, Okay. And then a year later, oh, Edison inv Edison invents it independently and files a patent. You have he can make you stop using it. Well, uh, actually, there's a there's an exception to the law since Obama changed it, um, which would give a prior user a limited defense. So un until until 2011, you you would you could be forced to stop. All right now, the question I have though is is how many how many cases have you seen of that? Where someone using something for personal use, like if I like build a mousetrap and have it, in, I mean, and, and have it in my house, oh, it, it it never happens because uh, companies right. just want they want to go after the big guys, but um, and their main competitors, but um, and plus they would they would have a hard time finding out. 
which is another reason IP is bullshit, because if someone is in their house using a light bulb that they made <coughs> and that they invented, and they're technically violating your rights, and you, you don't even know they're violating your rights, how, what kind of right is it that it can be violated without you even knowing it? Well, you know? I mean, I mean a, lot of, a lot of things, you know, a lot of rights can be violated without you knowing it. Like what? I walk across your property. Yeah, but in principle, you could know because um, – uh, you know, you could ha you could have a fence up or something, or sensors, and you could, you know, well, sensors, yes. But if you had a fence up and I climbed your fence, but the point is, when they're walking across your lawn, you actually cannot use your lawn for certain purposes. They, there is a conflict in the use there, even if you're unaware of it. You know, you can rape a woman when she's in a coma, and she might not be aware of it, but it's still rape, right? Well, right. I mean, that's good. I'm just saying there's something there's something <laughs> there's something unreal about the idea of um, of someone. On another planet, doing something that violates your rights, and you, and you can't even in principle know about it. it just it's it's well, not how it's not what property be, rights. It's not how property rights work. But that's the same thing that was if I if so like you said if I if you have a fence up right yeah and I jump your fence or let's say you don't even have a fence up you know but I and I just walk across your property right now you're saying that you know technically at that point in time I you can't do something. Yeah. with your lawn at that time yeah. but you can't you like you know if you want to do if you want to have a photo shoot and take a picture of your house for to sell it you can't you can't do that because the right, guys in the picture right. and you know there's there's right. all kind of things but you can't do at that at that time you would then know of that violation of your rights the point is it has an effect you you could know theoretically you know you could but but right but anyway it's, it's a side point but you, but, see, um, you, see, you see where I'm, I'm getting at is just you know it's like it's like Schrodinger's light bulb. Yeah. I guess you know. I mean, you don't know that it's being used unless you actually see it being used or not being used. But you but you also realize that all no in, no innovation comes out of nothing. Every innovation always is always incremental. It's always building upon past innovations of others, right? So Einstein didn't invent glass. He didn't invent electricity. Mm -hmm. I mean, not Einstein, Edison. You know, he put things together that were already known. And if Edison had tried to invent the light bulb in the year 1700, he wouldn't have been able to do it because the background technology wasn't there yet. And if someone well, tried to invent the if someone tried to invent the light bulb in the year in the year uh, you know 1950, it would have been easy because everything was ready to go. So mm -hmm. basically, things become invented when the technology is about <laughs> right for it to be invented. So someone's usually going to invent it because everything is ready. So you basically make a tiny incremental improvement based upon all the innovations in the past, which you're treating like the public domain. You're using it for free, and you get you get a claim on the whole thing, on the whole light bulb. Right, because you're putting the you're putting the pieces together. Yeah, but other people are putting it together too, or they could. Right, they could, but they didn't. They but they did actually sometimes. I mean that, that's why we have what's called a race to the patent office. So um, under right. the current right. laws, since Obama under the current law, we have a first to file approach. So if 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 inventor A invents something, and then six months later inventor B invents it, but then inventor B files the next day at the patent office, he gets the patent, not the first guy. Right. So what's stopping inventor A from going and filing for the patent? Maybe he, he maybe he he's trying to perfect it, or maybe he doesn't have the money to hire a patent lawyer just yet. He's trying to save up for that. I don't. It doesn't well, I mean, matter. There's, I mean, there's there's such, such a thing as you know, like the poor man's copyright. No, there's not. There's a provisional patent, but it's but you, well, know. you you know what the poor man's copyright is. Yeah, that's that's a myth. That's not that's not real. And for really? the audience, a poor man's copyright is. Um, the idea that you take something and you put it in a sealed envelope and mail it to yourself, and then you don't open it when it comes back. Not just not just not just mail, but certified mail. Yeah, so that you have a postmark and you can prove it was mailed to you. And that's really that's had nothing to do with copyright. It doesn't that doesn't that's not how copyright law works anymore. Copyright law works now by it's uh, since 1980 something when we joined the Berne Convention, we modified the patent law to abolish formalities. Which means that copyright is now automatic. As soon as you write something down on paper, um, you have a copyright in it. Whether you publish it, whether you put the word copyright on it, whether you register huh. with the copyright office, it's automatic. Which is another problem with it. It's it's it, you can't yeah, even get rid of it. There's no way to see, get rid of it. And see, I, I don't agree with that. I I don't agree with that particular thing. And and this is the problem with okay. I don't insist everyone has to be a patent attorney, but when you're a libertarian. <laughs> 
You're supposed to go with the core principles. And if you start approving of a massive federal statutory scheme that you don't really understand, you really should be cautious and humble about it. Like be be careful about advocating something where you you obviously don't understand the law very well because it's complicated. And it's horribly unjust. Yeah. Even in your lights, it's unjust. I could give you a dozen other features of these laws, which are obviously unjust even to you. Um, you know, you can, and, you can, for I example, there's and, there's statutory damages for copyright. You can you can have to pay a hundred and I think one hundred fifty thousand dollars per act of infringement, even if there's no actual damages, right? And, and every act of infringement would be like copy. Like this woman, Jamie Thomas, just uploaded one 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 song. Yeah, you know, the, the Napster thing that was fucking no, ridiculous. That was Napster was ridiculous too. But yeah, but see, this is the problem. When I talk to libertarians who think they're per IP, and I start listing horrible uh, aspects of the law or examples, right. you always say, "Oh, I agree with you on that. I agree with you on that." And, 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 I, and I'm left. I'm left I asking, said, "Well, then, what the hell are you in favor of?" You don't. And they say, <laughs> "Well, I'm not an expert. I don't know." It's like, "Well, then, why are well, you I saying?" No, but, I, but I am giving. But I am giving you things that I'm in favor of, and I'm saying that there are things that need to be reformed as well. You know, yeah, but, I, but I, all I, but all the other libertarians who are pro IP have a different thing than you. Some think it should be in perpetuity. Some mm -hmm. think it should be a customized term. Some think it should be shorter. Some think it should be longer. Some think it should be this. Some think it should be the founders' copyright, and you think it should be life of the author only. But they're all arbitrary. How am I supposed to pick between these proposals? They're all arbitrary. None are grounded well, in libertarian principles. No, I think that they are. I, I, I think I think that they are. You know, you know why you think they are? Let me, let me get to it. I think the mistake you have is a, a mistake a lot of libertarians have, and it's because of the influence of Ayn Rand and even John Locke, which you might not even be aware of, but that's sort oh, of I'm seeped into it. I don't mean you're not aware of them, but you uh, – uh, uh, a Even man if, like, should not be provided for not should not be deprived of the fruits of his labor. Um, I don't. Damn it! I had to quote. I just can't quote it from memory. Well, so um, th so this is the problem with arguing by metaphors. Uh, talking about the fruits of your labor. I mean, you know, this the, the, this term fruit arose because number one, we have literal fruit, and what that means is when you when you have a tree, it produces fruit. Mm -hmm. And so if you own the tree, you own the fruits of the tree, okay? Mm -hmm. So – but you don't own the fruit because of some natural law that says you own the fruits of things that you own. It's simply because you own the thing, and when the thing rearranges its form like, – so if you own a piece of metal and you shape it into a, a, a sword, you own the sword. But you mm -hmm. don't own the sword because you created it. You own the sword because you own the metal that you made it into. Do you, would you agree with that? And what do I own right here? You own your brain because you own your body. Exactly. But you don't own then, you don't you don't own your, your you don't own your labor or your thoughts or your effort. So I don't own my thoughts. No. They're not an ownable thing. Thoughts is just what your brain does. Look, if you go for a jog, do you think you own mm -hmm. your jogging? No. Your jogging is just so what you're action. doing with your body, right? Right. But at the same but at the same time. My thoughts actually can produce something. Jogging doesn't produce anything. Your thoughts can't produce anything, actually. Your thoughts can guide your act, your your actions. That's what they can do. Your thoughts guide the control you have over your body. It can make your body move in certain ways. And when you do that, you can manipulate scarce resources in the world to causally intervene to change things. That's what we do as actors. But and 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 without my thoughts, these are useless. Correct. Yeah, we need intelligence. Okay. To, well, every, most animals have a brain. They they need something to guide their their right. to guide their body. So if, if I but if I don't if I don't think of the thing, these don't make the thing. That's correct. Uh, okay. In, in, an intellect and a will and thoughts and creativity are necessary for human success, successful human action. There's no doubt no doubt about that. Right. And so when I am talking about owning the fruits of of, of my labor, I'm talking about my mental labor but, as well. But you don't. But you don't own the fruits of your labor. Why do you say you own the fruits of your labor? Because if yeah. I don't, if, because if I don't create it, it doesn't exist. That that doesn't follow. Uh, um, first of all, you don't create anything. We don't create anything. We min we rearrange things, right? I mean, I guess if we want to get to the like, like yeah, we need to be yeah, we atoms, need to be clear about it. Yeah, yeah, we need to be clear about it. You don't create matter. You know, even Ayn Rand said that we rearrange matter. We don't create matter. You agree with that, right? Right, but it, you know, when we, we you know, we're, we're, this is the thing. This is where I'm talking about where we get into the 
utopianist and 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 pragmatic and you know and things no, of it's, that it's, it's not it's, it's it, honestly i i have elements of both in my belief i i'm i believe in principles or what you call natural rights but i also believe in pragmatism and because i think they converge to each other they support each other i so let, let me let me explain it this way and see see where you would disagree um okay we live in this world of scarcity now that what that means is scarcity it's a better word might be conflict conflictability that in other words we have our bodies and we live on this a, a planet full of raw mm -hmm. materials that are all scarce in the sense of we could use them to do things like we can use them as means of action but other people could too but we can't both do it at the same time because it's just that's not their nature like it, it, you know if 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 uh if some some someone wants to have sex with my body but i don't want them to uh, we can't both have our desires fulfilled. <laughs> so the question is, who gets to choose how to use my body? And we libertarians say that each person gets to choose how to use his body. That's what we call self ownership. Would you agree with that? Yes. So everyone, everyone is the presumptive owner of their own body, right? Correct. And the reason you need ownership rights in your body is because you need to be able to tell someone no. You need to be able right. to decide when they can use your body or when or when they can't use your body. That's what it means right. to own something is to have the right to deny someone permission to use that resource, right? Correct. Now, in the world, we also live in the world, and we need to roam around this world and use the land and, and use, use food and water and make mm -hmm. objects that are useful. Those are scarce means of action, and those things are also scarce, meaning there can be conflict over them. They're conflictable things, right? And so mm -hmm. what the libertarians say is we, we – we basically take a, an extreme or a consistent version of what the private law has always done in the West, like in Rome and in England, which is we say, number one, you, you can own – each person can own his body, but he also can own other things out in the world that were previously unowned by, number one, starting to use it. Like if you're the first one to use it, like if you homestead a, a farm in the middle of nowhere, now you own right. that, that, that tract of land, correct? And if I if I chop down some unowned trees and I use them to build a log cabin, now I own those logs and the lumber and the timber and the house that I built. Now I own right. it not because I created it, but I own it because I appropriated it. I took it out of the unowned state of the world and I started using it and I made a connection between me and the thing by by transforming it basically or putting a fence up around it, something like that. Would you agree roughly with mm -hmm. that? Roughly, yeah. OK, and a second way that I can come to own these things is I can purchase it from someone who already owned it. So I could see someone who's already done this. He's already homesteaded a farm and built a little a log cabin on it, and I can go buy it from him. No, th that's yeah. that's the only way to come to own things is you either you either find it in an unowned state and you take it to yourself. You appropriate it or you buy it from someone who had it. That is the only two ways to come to own something. There is a third, but it's subsidiary. That is, if you if you do harm to someone, you and you owe them reparations or restitution, you might have to give them some of your property to pay to compensate them. But that you can view of that as like a so at that, that time. But that at, let me that's ask like you a this. type of contract the, too. Yeah, go ahead. Say for example, you do me harm. Yes. Right. Yes. And so, which means I'm I'm trespassing against you or your property. I'm using your property. Without your consent, that's what it means mm -hmm. to trespass. It's the it's the right. opposite. So, it's the correlate. It's the correlate of what ownership is. Your ownership of those things means you have the right to tell me not to use it. So if I do it anyway, that's trespass, and now I've damaged you. And so I have to, mm -hmm. by me using your property without your consent, you can effectively do the same to me. You can get back at me. You can take some of my stuff from me to make yourself whole. We can call that. You can call that rectification or reparations or restitution or whatever you want to or call it. Or could it it's also a, be, you know, could it be also considered that at that time that I do own some of your property? Yes. Okay. I think so. so. That's what I'm saying. There's a there's so there's three ways to come to own property. One is you find it unowned and you homestead it, mm -hmm. which which means you have to transform it or embroider it somehow. You have to you have to establish a public connection between you and things so other people can see. That you have a claim to it, and that they can mm -hmm. they can respect your property. They have to see the connection between you and the thing. It has to have a border, basically. Um, 
for them to know that it's yours and for them to know how not to trespass. So if you transform raw iron into a sword, that's pretty obvious that you've transformed that thing and you've you've homesteaded that iron. Or if you build a farm, you put a fence up around it and you put a cabin on it, that's pretty obvious to see that someone has transformed it and is using it. And from historical records or just evidence, they can tell who it is. So there's a connection. So the second way is by contract. Someone owns it and they they give it or sell it to you. And the third way is rectification for for a tort. So that's the okay. only way so, you can come to own property. Okay. And the property <clears throat> is always a scarce resource, which is a tangible material. It's not an idea. But go ahead. I see. That's the thing. Is, is that's where I, I think. A well, let's lot of keep people... let's keep going for a second before we go there. But keep right. keep going. What was your question going to so, be about? Torch so here's the thing is so if you know you're you're saying that you know people have to know that they're trespassing you know so and and, and so forth right it has, it has to be and, at least it has to be at least possible in principle and the reason is because ownership means the 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 right to exclude people from your property which imply which presupposes the ability to communicate now look, you have to communicate your your wishes to other people so right. right. In other words, there has time, to be there has I, to be a possibility of language and communication, so you can say right. yes or no, and they can understand it. And and when you say yes or no, it has to be about something. So you you have to re mm -hmm. that when you say no, you're saying no, you can't use that. Well, that is the thing that that you don't want them to use, but right. you have to they have to know what you're talking about. So there has to be some discernible borders and some link between you and that, so they can know yes. that you have the right to tell them. That's why there has hence, to be a visible yeah right. Hence hence a patent. No, that has no. You no. That's the, so. The problem is you. It, it's not sufficient to to communicate. It's necessary to communicate. In other words, if I just say, I'm telling everyone right now, I own Mount Kilimanjaro, or sorry. I'm I'm telling sorry, the whole I, world, on, I'm I, going on the internet, I own Mars. Sorry, I missed part of that. Somebody was was trying to call me. Okay, what I said I, was I, communication is necessary, but it's not sufficient for ownership. Um, you have to communicate your ownership by establishing a link between you and a, and a given scarce resource. So number right. one, it has to be a scarce resource, and number two, uh, you have to do something. You can't just do it by mere verbal decree. So you can't say, hey, uh, there's an unowned right. island down there in the Bahamas. I'm hereby claiming it, but I've never even been there. Everyone can. Everyone's free to ignore that. So you you can't just – right. Or I can't say, hey, I hereby decree that I'm the owner of your cow. I mean, <laughs> you own the cow, right. not me, right? Right, but at this, you know, and, but see, the thing is, is that's also, you know, you're you're also talking about, like, for example, you know, turning iron into a sword. Okay. Correct. N now you own that thing, right? Not because you not because you made the sword though. Um, because you it, own it, the iron to make the sword. Yeah, because so if I work at a factory okay. making swords. I am the one making the swords, but do do I own the swords that come off the assembly no, line? But I, wait, hold no. on, I'm, let me let me get to let me get to my point here. <laughs> what I meant was is say oh, I say I built I make a sword out of my own iron, you know, so and so forth, right? Yes. And then I leave that sword somewhere. Yeah, you can abandon you can abandon it. Abandonment's possible. Abandonment is possible, but let's say I don't abandon it, I just yeah. forget it somewhere. Yeah. Right. I yeah. set it down. P possession and ownership are not the same. So you can own something and not possess it, and you can possess something and not own it. Like if if you borrow someone's sword, you possess it, but you don't own it. And if right. you if you loan your sword to someone, you own it, but you don't you're not possessing it. And if right, you just leave it somewhere, if it's not clear that you've abandoned it, then you still own it. But how does someone else know that? Well, uh, Sometimes it's not possible to know. There is there are there there is a possibility of an uncertain area, and that's because of the of the neglect of the owner. Um, but generally, there are conventions and default presumptions about things like that, and the context usually gives a signal. And the fact the fact that it is possible for there to be ambiguity means that people try to avoid that. So you would try not to leave it somewhere. Um, where it looks like it's abandoned or it might look right. like it's abandoned. So those cases would tend to be small because you're you're going to be punished. You're going to be harmed by it because you, you might lose your sword in some cases because of the uncertainty uh, or it might be too expensive to sort it out or whatever. So you might leave it somewhere and you might put a note on it saying, hey, I'm going to be back in, 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 in an hour. This is mine. And then right, there would be evidence. You know? 
right? But at the same time, if you don't, right, you were talking like you were talking about, you know, letting people know about ownership by, you know, like for example, putting yes. up no trespassing signs and things, things of that nature. Yeah. But if yeah. I if I lean a sword up against a tree, and then I leave it, and there's no note, and someone else comes and goes, oh, somebody abandoned a sword. Yeah. If, if that if that kind of thing happens often enough, then people are not going to just leave their sword against a tree when when without somehow indicating that they're not abandoning it. Uh, I mean, you know, well, if I leave my bicycle, intentionally, intentionally <laughs> no, but well, accidentally. Listen, all you're all you're pointing out is that property rights are not perfect because you got to you got to remember what Neither what happens here. Rights. Hold on, we we we. This is not a flaw in property rights. It's not an unjustness. It just means that they can't do everything. We, we, we live in a world where we, we will have the need to use resources, and if we don't have property rights, then we have a war of all against all. And we have constant fighting and conflict and violence, and we, some of us don't like that. So we prefer a world where we can right. minimize the conflict. So we come up with these property rights to assign ownership to these things <clears throat> in an attempt to, to reduce exactly. or minimize all this violence, and it does do that. It doesn't eliminate it completely because some people still violate rights, and sometimes mm -hmm. sometimes uh, there are edge cases which are in between like the sword case you gave, and property rights can't solve that. So what? Hence, that that doesn't IP mean that, that IP rights are just. Has nothing to do with IP rights. So l let me keep so, going. And I'm I'm going to try to trap you, but uh, only fairly. <laughs> oh, okay, no, so I didn't see that coming at all. So it, given the way I just laid out these rights, I think you can agree roughly with that. Just like you agree with me earlier about negative versus positive welfare rights, right? Like you think, that, like that's a fair characterization of what our rights are. We own our we own our bodies, and we own other things in the world that we found that were unowned or that we bought by contract. That's basically the the picture, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and 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 with with the things that you own, you're free to use those things in any way you see fit, as long as you don't what as lo as long as you don't use other people's property without their permission, right? In other words, I don't. Right. If I have a big farm, I can I can have a new I can have a nude beach party on it. If I want to, not because I have a right to have a nude beach party, but because my action is is not interfering with anyone else's use of their property, right? Right. So if I have a cannon, I can shoot the cannon, but I can't shoot it into your property because now I'm my cannonball is trespassing the borders of your house, right? Right. And but that's not a limitation of, of my ownership of my cannon because it's got nothing to do with my cannon ownership. If I stole a cannon and I have a stolen cannon, I still don't have the right to shoot it into your house. The reason is not because of limitations. Somebody, on was, somebody was trying to call me. Can you give me one second? Yeah, sure. Hold on. No, this background doesn't work. Okay, I'm back. Uh, so what my point is the fact that I can't shoot a cannon into your house… Is not doesn't mean my property rights in my cannon are limited. It means my actions are limited. Like I'm free to do, mm -hmm. I'm free to engage in any any actions I want as long as I don't use someone's property without their permission. Right? That's the basic libertarian principle. Correct? Okay. So 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 let me ask you something. You can't fire your cannon into my property. I can't fire right? anyone's cannon into your property. I can't fire my cannon. I can't fire a stolen cannon. Yes. I can't fire a borrowed cannon. <laughs> so it's, it's got so nothing I, to do with my ownership of the cannon. I can't use right, it. No, I understand that. Yeah. So, right. so let me ask you this. Say you know your cannon can fire 300 yards, right? Yes. And you get the permission of the property owner that's, you know, let's say my, my, my property is only 100 yards wide, right? And you get permission from the neighbor that's, you know, 300 yards down the road to fire a cannon into his property. Okay. But the ball passes through my property. Through the airspace, you mean? Through, through the air. So the question I have is, is do you believe in air rights? Sure. Within, yeah, I, th I think that there, there are some air rights, but 
it's not it's not right. it doesn't go all, all the way to the heaven i mean it doesn't go it only goes so far and common right. the common law would typically custom and common law and agreement would typically find find answers to these things just like right. just like underground rights you you have rights underneath your house too to a certain degree but it doesn't mm-hmm. go to the core of the earth however right. if someone if someone dug a tunnel like you know a mile under your house i don't think that's trespassing on your rights but if they caused your house to to collapse that would be that would be uh causing uh, damages that'd be causing damage to your property but right. I, i'm but that those are interesting but kind of irrelevant to where i'm heading so well, not necessarily not necessarily all right. All right. because you know Air, you know, basically, you're not doing any damage to my property. You know, you're not touching my property, but it's, it, you know, you're basically. Going, no, I think, I think, know, I think shooting a cannonball just over my roof line um, uh, is cause is basically a trespass because number one, it's imposing a large risk uh, on me. And one reason I buy a house is, line, I, yes, what's but that? If it's, you know, over a field. I you think know. it depends. It depends on the context. Yeah, I think it, I think it actually depends. If it's an occasional use that no one notices, it doesn't do it really. The, the the essential question is: Does it disturb the owner's ability to use his property in its say normal, um, the normal way that he's homesteaded it and the way he's using right. it? And, so and, if, this if it what, and this is why I you know I I bring up IP rights um, is because you know for example like I said say I I I come up with transparent steel right mm-hmm. i spend 20 years you know testing it creating you know and finally yes i i eureka i've made it right yes. you know without ip rights someone could come up right behind me and go yoink thanks for all the hard work sucker and create it and sell it and that causes damage to me. No, it, how how does it cause damage to you? How, how does it trespass against your property? Because it because it basically wastes twenty years. Yeah, but but see, you're going to metaphor. Look, you just see, you just seem to agree with the way I laid it out. I said we have property rights in our bodies and in scarce resources that we homestead or that we buy by contract from someone else, and that means no one can. Tr- can invade the borders of these things. They can't use them without my permission. Now, when someone copies your idea and they make their own steel with their own resources, how are they trespassing against anything that you own? Because I still own my my creation, my idea. They're not, they're not trespassing my... against your creation. They're co- they copied it. They learned from you. They're not trespassing against anything. They how are they interfer- How are they interfering from you from using your your property? Because they're basically, ta- you know, taking sales. You don't own sales. What are sales? Sales means customers give you their money, right? Mm-hmm. Who owns that money? When they give it to me, I do. Before before they give it to you, who owns it? They do. So they have a right not to give it to you, right? Correct. So if they don't give it to you, you don't own it. Correct. So what sale? You don't. So you're never entitled to sales. You're not entitled to potential future they, customer but, money. But if I don't, if if they're able to to copy, you know, my my invention, yeah, right, and sell it, that if they if they weren't allowed to do that, yeah, no, it makes it harder for you money, to, yeah. But you're not, you're not, you don't have a right to have sales. I mean, my God, why? How can you be in favor of free market competition with this kind of reasoning? If if I own the only pizza restaurant in town, right, and mm-hmm. another one pops up across the street, now I'm losing sales. Right? It's harder for me to sell at a higher price to my customers that I that I was hoping to sell to because now half of them are going to go to my competitor. Not necessarily. Well, but they could. And some of them will. You know, if I have the only co- little dinky ass coffee shop in town and Starbucks opens up, what do you think is going to happen? If I've got a shitty hardware store and, and Walmart opens up, what's going to happen? They're going to steal my customers. Right. If, steal if my sales. Hardware, it know. doesn't matter. Competition always takes, so, it's, it's always a threat to your business. That's why mm-hmm. 
That's why people don't like competition. <clears throat> That's why they try to get governments to pass laws to protect them from competition, like from the tariffs to protect them from overseas competition, right? And minimum wage laws to protect them from small companies competing with them, like Walmart's in favor of the minimum wage for that reason, because they're going to pay minimum wage anyway. So make right, it higher, yeah, yeah. you know. And that's why people want patents to protect them from competition from competitors. I mean, the sword example we gave earlier. What if I take a piece of metal and make it into a sword, and someone else sees that and they go, "Oh, that's a good idea," and they go, they they find their own metal and they make their own sword. Should they not be allowed to make a sword because I did it first? No, because you're not actually copying exactly their, you know. Yeah, no, that's bullshit. That's how patents work. If let's I say, let's say okay, so you make a sword, right? Yeah, let's say right. no one ever made a and, knife or a sword before. Right, and you make a and you make a, a a broadsword, right? Whatever. No, hold on, that's not whatever. Let's say you make a broadsword, right? Yeah. And I make a scimitar. Yeah, the the patent it system. Is markedly, the, it is markedly different. Wrong, wrong. You don't know. See, this is the problem. You you don't even understand the system that you think you're in favor of. The patent system. I I tell you what would happen if 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 someone invented a sword, and he came to me, I would file a patent and say, I hereby claim a uh, a cutting uh, a weapon comprising um, mm -hmm. steel shaped with at least one edge and at least. You know, two feet long, uh, terminating at a handle with a guard of at least so many inches, and that's it. And so that would cover a scimitar. It would cover uh, long daggers and long swords, and it would cover all kinds of things. That's how that's how patents work. You you claim it as broadly as you can. You know, let me give you another example. If I'm the first guy to invent a um, a stool. Okay. No one's thought of a chair yet, just a stool. So I would claim it as um, a sitting implement comprising um, a, a relatively horizontal seat member operationally connected to at least three legs that, of, of roughly equal length. Okay. That's a stool. And mm -hmm. someone else says, oh, if I put a back on that thing, it's the chair. That's even more useful. Right. And they file a patent on a chair, which is a stool having a back. Now, the guy that invented the chair can't make his chairs because they're stools because it has a it has a seat and legs. That's what a stool is. The right. fact that it has a back doesn't make it not a stool because a, a, a chair is a stool with a back. You follow me? So the guy that invents the chair, which is an improvement on the stool, can't sell it and make it. And the guy that invented the stool can't make a chair either because he would be violating the other guy's patent. And see, and and and, and therein lies another reform that I think that that you know. But that that, that is that that is impo that that's impossible to reform. That is the patent. No, that's what patents because, are. But see, that's what patents are. But that doesn't mean that that's what. That's that they can't be reformed to. But to, you said you don't want to get rid of. I mean, if you change that, then it's it, not a patent system. It's something else. No, it is. It it's is not. I, I, it, I, I've been doing this, this for I'm thirty saying. years, it's man. Just, this, this is. I I understand that. I'm saying things like that now. Now, here's the thing: is you're saying that's what patents are, right? But if we reform it, to, but, but that's but, no longer what how they are. So if when I you, so no no you're, you're it, wrong. A patent is a right. On an invention, okay, right. That it that in in itself means that if you have a right in that invention, it would cover improvements on the invention because they would still be the invention. And and see that's that's like I said, reform. You can't you can't you you want something impossible. You can't have it be both things at once. No, you can't. If you if if for example, let's say we make the patent law to be when you if you patent something right, you have the patent to that particular item right you have to submit schematics and drawings and so on and so forth and then you have the patent for that particular item right now if someone comes along and sees that right and they like i say they put a, a back on it and they add a leg and they put arms on it so it is materially different than the item that you have a patent on. Then they can have a patent on that, and you can't turn around and you know 
make. I, I, I think there. I, I you hear what you're saying. Your stool. What you're doing is <laughs> you're hearing a natural, obvious, simple uh, consequence of the patent system, which seems absurd to you because it is. And you're doing what every IP libertarian I know does. You're saying, well, I don't agree with that, so I would have a different. But so you you want to you want to change the term. You want to you want to get rid of statutory damages and copyright. You want to um, you want to narrow the scope of patents uh, because and uh, hence the reform. But it, it, but this reform, is just like yeah. this. You you sound just like liberals who favor a minimum wage of say fifteen dollars, and when we say something like. Well, why don't we just make it a hundred? They say, "Oh, that's ridiculous," or they say, "Oh, that would hurt the economy too much." They're willing to hurt the economy a little bit for fifteen dollar wage, but then it won't hurt the economy that much. So you're like, "Well, we can we can have outrageous examples to a small degree, but we don't, I don't want a big big amount of outrageous uh, outrageous consequences." Well, this is how, this is how this is how societies and you know societies work. No, you but, know, they, you, you, no. Your assumption though is here, here's your assumption. Your assumption okay. is that. No patent system is bad, and a terrible mm -hmm. patent system is bad. But in between, there's a good you – no, know, there's like there's a sweet spot, and we need to adjust to find the sweet spot. But your assumption is that no patent Isn't system that, is bad. That's that's the yeah. that's your mistake. No, I don't think it's a mistake. You know, I mean that's that's that you think it's a mistake, obviously. You know that well, I'm, you know I'm, I'm you, certain you, that it's I'm certain that it's a mistake. <laughs> And just as I'm certain that it's not. <laughs> yeah, but I've but I have I have I have heard and examined every argument for IP that has ever existed, and uh, and I'm uh, you know uh, still of the opinion that you know why. Well, and, I mean the way this the, the way this started was listen I, I, the way this started was I was always interested in libertarian theory, and I, I was always puzzled by the by the argument for patents because it, there was problems with it. Like Ayn Rand, you know, said, "Oh yeah." Uh, uh, it makes sense for there to be a finite term for copyright, and, and but her reasoning yeah. was just it made no sense. It was, and and so I I, I thought, well, I'm going to be a patent attorney and a libertarian thinker, so I'll figure this shit out. <laughs> so I started. Yeah. I try. I tried to come up with arguments defending intellectual property, and I kept failing, which is unlike me. <laughs> and I kept wondering, I'm like, damn, I'm pretty smart. I'm good at this shit, and I can't figure it out. Why am I failing? Well, so I, mean, I, I I tried, and finally I realized, oh, now I know why I'm failing. I'm failing because I'm trying to justify the unjustifiable. This system is horrible. Rand, Ayn Rand misled me, man. Well, no, I mean, so for example, I was re I was reading on, on your uh, your 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 article here. Um, now you were saying, like, for example, like uh, uh the the thing about adjusting your carburetor. Yeah, to you know, yeah. double it, the output and such and so, so yes. like that. Yes, in the IP world that I would envision, okay, that is perfectly acceptable. Why that is that because that is materially different. Oh no, it's not. No, no, no. You're wrong. That's not materially different. It might be de minimis, but it's not materially different. So if I so if I see a carburetor and go and if I add this there and I change that to this and I move that over there. Well, and, listen, if if you're gonna if you're gonna change your patent system to be really narrow like you're talking about, then I could just modify my example. So so for example, um I, I have a patent I have a patent on a carburetor with exactly these this shape. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh and someone reads my someone reads my patent and they go into the garage and they they change their carburetor around to be exactly like I described in the patent. No, they're doing it in the privacy of their garage with their own raw materials, but they do have a carburetor. When they're done modifying it, it's exactly what I claimed in my patent. So that would mm -hmm. that that would not be a materially different. It would it would be exactly what was claimed in the patent. So it would be patent no, no, infringement. No, no, no. You're, you're, no, you're saying you're saying that you were talking about someone who goes and changes the carburetor to double the output and everything like that. But because that's the way patent law works now, I'm I'm giving an example of the way the patent system as it presently exists works. But if we modified it to your system, you would still have unjust results like that because you could have cases where someone does exactly the same thing. Yeah, someone the someone could you know go. I need a carburetor. I'm going to make you know this. All right. Now, mind you, if someone did that, I mean, 
I don't think any court in the world. I mean, I guess I guess a court. See, could, see now you're hope you're hoping that there will be uh, pressure relief valves that that save you from the consequences of this stupid system you're in favor of. I mean, you you can't no, just hold on, punt. Hold on, hold on. I'm saying is, I guess a court could technically, if if, if I as the creator of the carburetor, right? Yeah. Found out that you made an exact copy of my carburetor and you know are using it for your own you know benefit or whatever i guess i could technically take you to court yes and request you, and request damages or you could even or you could request an injunction you could ask the court to give me an injunction ordering me not to use that carburetor and if i do it i could go to jail i don't but that's the thing is, is i don't think you don't favor that <laughs> now well, you don't no, favor don't injunctions it, I, I, no, I don't think any court in the world would, and, and I don't think any You're wrong. patent holder <laughs> would, you know, take someone to court. You're totally wrong. So, some patent holders are in it for money, but some are in it uh, for other reasons. Like there's a there's this company called Inchain, and uh, they've been acquiring lots of Bitcoin related patents, and they're threatened. They're, you know, they're threatening to sue. Competing blockchains because they they want to be the only one standing. They don't they're not doing it. For, I mean, they might do it for money, but there's lots of things that could be existential threats to people. I'll take. Uh, how about a better example? Someone invents anti lock brakes or the seatbelt. Mm -hmm. Okay, they okay. invent the seatbelt, and they won't let any other automaker put seatbelts in their car because they want to be the only car that can sell seatbelts. So you have Ford, Chevy, uh, you know. Um, Okay, so uh, in and my, so in only my only Fords say only Fords have seatbelts, and so wrong. Basically, you're killing people because they're going to be buying wrong. Chevys without a seatbelt. Wrong, Why? not not in the not in the IP world that I I you know that I. Why? If you invent here, a seatbelt, okay. if you invent a seatbelt, can't you stop uh -huh. other people from from making seatbelts? Other competitors? No, no. What the hell? Hold on, I'll explain. How many seat belts out there do you think there are? Millions. Tens of no, millions. How many billions. How many, how many, no, how many seat belt types? Well, there used to be lots of types, but nowadays they're pretty standard. It's, it's, uh, they used to be the automatic ones, but <clears throat> they've all gone away. It's, right. it's, 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 it's pretty – Okay. There's, so, there's probably so, several types. Sports cars have one type, but right. – you know, uh, And then there's the there's – the, Five point harness. Okay, so what? Oh, oh, because, so what you're talking about is so I'm for it. I create the the uh, I don't know what it, what it's called with the lap belt and the shoulder belt, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Say again. So I I create the the oh the the over this shoulder. Yeah. And lap belt seat yeah. belt. I'm for the, it, right? The, the common seat belt that we mostly use nowadays. Yeah. Yes. So I'm Chevy. I'm like, okay, seat belt. Okay. I can't use an over the shoulder across the lap seat belt, right? So in the IP world that I'm envisioning, where basically you can you can only patent, you know, this thing, not some a restraint system that stops someone from going forward in the case of an, you know, whatever. Dude, you're, the way you're, it is you're, now. you're trying to fight the hypo too, but you're assuming there's always an alternative. There's not always an alternative. That's bullshit. Okay. So I'm saying you can't so, guarantee there's I'm, always an alternative. You cannot guarantee there's always an alternative. Right. I can't, you're right. I can't guarantee it. What I'm saying is, is there's options generally. All right. What about anti lock? What about anti lock brakes? Someone invents anti lock brakes. That saves lives. You know that, right? Yes. Now Ford is the only company that can do anti-lock brakes. Every other car manufacturer is legally prohibited from putting this life-saving feature in their car. Why? But there's other way, there's other brake systems out there. There's other anti-lock brake systems. There's an anti-lock brake system other than anti-lock brakes. That doesn't yes. make any sense. Because you can you can modify it. You're assuming there's always another way to do it. That's bullshit. And by the way, that's not how patents work now, anyway. So I mean, I understand. Why? Why don't you? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you tell me, Stefan? 
I think there should be some kind of IP system. I'm not an expert, and I'm just trying to come up with this on the fly, so I don't really know why I'm in favor of. No, but I, I would agree. Because... I would agree with you that the patent system that we have now has so many horrible features. I would agree with you that it's better to have nothing than that patent <clears throat> system. Because I don't. How do you uh, know? But don't. how do you know? How do you know that the patent system we have now, with all of its problems, is better than having no patent system? How do you know that having no patent system is better than having the system we have now? Because patents are evil. <laughs> I don't. I don't have <laughs> See, this. That's, subje I, that's that's subjective. No, it's not. That's subjective. It's completely not. It's 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 it follows directly from my libertarian principles, and it should follow from yours. You just no, don't sorry, see that. I, I, I miss. I misspoke. That's not. It's not. It's. It's. Uh, you know, no. No. It is subjective. You know. You believe that it's that it that it's evil. No. That's not. That's, it's not just a feeling. It, this is. A, this is the consequent. This is the. This is the conclusion of a chain of reasoning and analysis based upon the nature of these systems and these rights, and how they necessarily conflict with, with legitimate property rights. Now, you could say that the only the only argument for intellectual property. Is to abandon libertarianism. You could say, well, no. you could say, well, you're right that intellectual property rights violate libertarian property rights, but I don't give a fuck because I'm not a libertarian. You, you're far, perfectly free to do that, and then we then we're de then we're just debating libertarian principles. But you said you agreed with those. Listen, let me give you another way to look at it. Uh, if if you own a house with a beautiful rose garden, and your all your neighbors love to look at it because it's pretty. And it, let's say it even okay. enhances the value of their own homes because um, okay. the view from their windows is is nicer. Now, if you chop down your rose garden, does that that does lower the value of their property? But does that violate their rights? Is that a trespass against their rights? No, no. And if you are a neighbor and you paint your house an ugly orange, does that violate? Your neighbor's rights, even if they don't like having a house like no. that in their neighborhood. No. So, uh, it, quite often in a neighborhood, you'll have a, res a, res a restrictive covenant, you know, or, 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 you, or a homeowner association with restrictive covenants. Are you familiar with these? Mm. Yes. You don't like them? <laughs> a lot of I my don't libertarian like HOAs. A lot of my libertarian friends hate HOAs. I love them. But uh, anyway. <laughs> wait, hold on. Wait. You like HOAs? Absolutely. They're private. <laughs> I've never had a bad experience with one. I've, they've always been great. Oh God! I know people have had bad experiences, but in any case, then how uh, could you? How could I mean? I'm sorry, but with an HOA, no. I mean, yes, there you enter into the uh, agreement, yeah, you know, you everything like that. Yes, you do. Yes, but at the same time, they, you know, it's it's so massively arbitrary. It's not. It's the rules are specified in in the charter. It basically, it's, HOA basically uh, requires you to pay some dues, and it and it <clears> gives you, <throat> gives you some benefits, and it, it puts some limitations on what you can use your property for. Um, certain certain things you cannot use your property for, like commercial uses or things like that. Um, but so, for example, if you and I are neighbors and we have a beautiful little neighborhood. And we just don't want anyone building um, a high rise, or we don't want people painting their house really ugly colors. Then we could all come together and we could sign an agreement between each other where we all agree no one's going to paint their house orange without the permission of all the neighbors. Do you do you agree that that's a legitimate type of arrangement people can make? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, people can enter into into contracts and things yeah. of that nature. But now, the, the problem with with, the, with HOAs is the fact that they sit there and will use, you know, um, say something like, you know, uh, you cannot put signs in your front yard, right? Yeah. And if you put a a, a flag on a on a, a flagpole on your you know on your porch. I see where they're like, oh, that's a sign. You can't yeah. do it. And it's like, no, that's not a sign. It's a flag on a flagpole. They're like, no, it's yeah. a sign. No, no, I know. I, I, I'm not arguing in favor. I'm just I, that's irrelevant to this point. I, I'm just, I'm, right. and you can forget about HOAs. I'm trying to talk. Like, let's say you have two, just two neighbors, A and B. They live next to each other, and let's say uh, one of them has a driveway right next to the other guy, and uh, let's say A has a driveway, and B needs a driveway 
So instead of building his own driveway, he asked, hey, hey, can I – would you mind selling me a, a, a limited usage right to use your driveway? Like we can both drive on the same driveway, and then I can – at the end of it, I can go on my property. Like you could see – property rights being divided up like that like a might say sure give me ten thousand dollars and i'll give you lifetime usage rights of my driveway to access your property mm -hmm. you can see something like that correct yes that's like an ease is in a sense it's an easement which is a dividing up of your, of your rights right All right now you could also have what's called negative easements so which is like what a homeowner association does like the the, the covenant might say no one can paint their house uh, orange, okay. That doesn't give your neighbors the right to use your house, but it gives them the right to prevent you from using it in a certain way that normally you would have the right, right? Right. Like it, you could have like the rose example I gave earlier. You could have a covenant saying uh, if you uh, uh, if you have uh, oak trees on your property more than X years old, you cannot chop them down without permission of, of the association. Right. Because it destroys okay. the beauty of it. You know, you could have things like that. So you could have two landowners who live next to each other, and one of them could grant the other one a negative easement, like for for money or something, you know. Like mm -hmm. A and B could both agree, look, uh, um, I don't know. Let's say they're, they're let's say they're both raising pigs and mm -hmm. they don't want the other they don't want the other one to raise some other animal that might uh harm the pigs, you know. I don't know. Alligators or something, so they they both they both agree. Let's let's agree to a, a negative easement each. I'm going to grant you a negative easement, and you're going to grant me a negative easement that you can't use your property for anything commercial except for pigs. Right? You agree with that? That's a negative easement. Yes. Now the reason we you and I both agree that that's uh, compatible with libertarianism is because it's just the owner. Agreeing to a limitation, he's consenting to it. So okay. it's just so it's just like um, if if some guy has sex with a girl, if she consents, it's not rape. But if she doesn't consent, it's rape. Like it's, the act looks the same, but it's it depends yes, upon. Right. So there's nothing right. wrong with a negative easement on property as long as the owner consents to it. But if the government passed a law saying, "Hey, Kinsella, you can't." You can't uh, you can't paint your house orange without your neighbor's consent. That's the government giving my neighbor a negative easement on my property, which I didn't consent to. That's no, the problem. I, I see, I, Do you agree with me on that? I, I, I yeah, I, I, I mean, I see where you're coming from from, from that angle. Okay. okay. So, so the the point is, generally, we're free to use our resources however we want, as long as we don't commit trespass. Unless mm -hmm. we voluntarily or consensually agree to a limitation like a negative easement. But if the government grants a negative easement on our property, they're taking our property rights from us. No, I and I and I see where you see you where know, I'm going. I, so, I no, I see where it's so where you're going with this. Now, what the patent system and the copyright too, but let's just stick to patents. The patent is mm -hmm. a negative easement because the patent basically says. If I own a factory, I can use it for mm -hmm. lots of things, but I can't use my raw materials to make this carburetor. That is, a, that is a negative easement. Now, if I consented to the negative easement, it would be legitimate. But if I don't consent to it, it's a violation of my property rights, and that's what patents are, and that's what copyrights are, and that's essentially why they're unjust. They are non-consensual negative easements imposed by the state. This is ultimately the principal problem with patent and copyright. They're, they're negative easements, which are not consented to by the people who own the property that's affected by the easement. Except they're not called easements; they're called property rights to confuse everyone and to help to help to help the propaganda in favor of them. They're not well, property rights. What's, your, what's racially with you know? For example, yes, you have a factory. You cannot. I can't make carburetors. Make that particular car. Correct. Rider. That's a limitation on my. That's a restriction on my property rights because I'm not. Yeah. I'm not committing a tort or a trespass, or, and I'm not in violation of a contract when I make that carburetor. But you are in violation of the contract. You know that. Like said, nope, like said, there's I, no contract. I, I am. No contract. There is a contract. What is it? You know, 
your continued existence in this particular uh, society. The social, the social contract. Uh, I mean, the uh, what do you call it? The uh, yeah, the social contract, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're basically now, you're, now you're, you're not sounding like a you're not sounding like much of a libertarian here. You're sounding more like a, a fucking Democrat or Republican who says, you know, uh, if, no. you, if you live here, you agree to abide by our laws. I mean, by that reasoning, you you know, the drug war doesn't violate your rights and the tax system doesn't violate your rights because, after all, you chose to stay here. But that's that's the whole point. Of, this is the, this is the whole point behind the you know reforming the I, the IP system. No, no, no. But you, you just you said there's a contract. There's no. Uh, come on, you know there's. No, I never agreed to the patent system. Yeah, I know. I understand that the whole idea behind there is the, the 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 libertarian you know theory behind you know I didn't agree to you know I was born in this into it. I didn't do agree to any any of this when well, I was born uh, into uh, this do, country. Uh, well, do you believe that the drug war violates rights? Do you believe taxation violates rights? Hold on, the drug war. Yeah. Yeah, you're threatened with prison if you don't if you don't if you're threatened with prison if you don't obey those laws. You're threatened with prison if you don't obey the tax laws. That's a violation of your rights, you know. It's called assault and battery or it's assault. It's they're extorting you. I mean, you're threatened with with prison if you do if you do a lot of things. Yeah. You know. But it, I mean, well, it's it's okay to threaten someone with prison for violating rights like murder or rape or something. But it's not okay to threaten someone with prison for doing something that doesn't violate anyone's rights. I mean, don't you regard the state as criminal? No. The, the uh, current American state, you oh don't think God, it's criminal? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you said earlier taxation is theft. Right. I mean, I do, I, I do believe that, that, you know, that the whole you know, income tax and everything like that, you know. I believe that the, yes, that is that is it's way overboard. No, no, no. It's, don't say it's overboard. It's it's a violation of rights. It's tr it's theft. This is why I'm a minarchist. <laughs> but you said you thought taxation is theft. I, I yes. I mean, I, I in the in the current sense in the current sense that we have taxation right now, it is. And, and and when the state puts someone in prison for 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 selling marijuana. Don't you think that's a violation of their rights? It's basically enslavement and kidnapping. And see, this is this is where this is where I guess we differ. Is I, I I do believe that there is a. Are you not against the drug war? I think it's. I think I said. I think it's. What about conscription for a war? Oh. What would the government puts people in prison if they if they refuse to refuse to fight in a war when they're conscripted? I no, I don't believe I don't believe in in I don't believe in the draft. No, I'm not saying believe in it. Do you think it violates someone's rights when they're conscripted? Yes, even though that, that's the that law. Any, I think that any being put into a situation where death is a potential and not just a potential but highly likely. Situation. You mean prison or war? War. It, you know. Well, they go to war voluntarily. To, yes. Because they're they're threatened with prison. <laughs> but they don't go. No, that's the thing. <laughs> they don't. If they're if you're threatened with prison, you're not going voluntarily. No, it's 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 voluntary. It's just not consensual. They're they're being coerced. <sighs> you know, if someone says, "Give me your give me your money, give me your wallet or your life." And you hand your wallet over. You're voluntarily handing it over. It's just that you were coerced. Uh, I don't. It's just. It's just. I, it's just a. It's just a definition. Yeah. That's why I don't I like the term. Like, that's why I don't like the term voluntarist. It, the problem is. Not, <laughs> well, listen. If you're driving down the road and you have a seizure, um, you um, uh, you, and you twist the handle, the, the steering wheel. That's an involuntary action because you didn't intend to do it. So voluntary usually means yeah. you, you chose to do it. It doesn't mean you weren't coerced. Yeah. Like off, you were offered a horrible alternative. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I just look at it. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a different. It's just, it's just semantics. It's just semantics. Yeah, but, uh, it's semantics. But anyway, I, I'm so I'm 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 uh, uh, so. Are you now saying that 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 because we live here, um, we're sort of consenting to everything the state does to us, including the patent system and no, the drug war? No, no. 
I, okay, this is so like then, I said, I, 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 this is why like I said, this is why I'm a men artist. I believe that there is, there is a, a role for the state. Most minarchists believe the state should only have courts and a military, and it should it should only use the police to and the jail system and the courts to stop aggression. That's it. And some of them believe you can have a, a small tax to support those core functions of government. That's called the night watchman state or the min, or the minarchist right, yeah. state. And but what they say is so the government is justified in monopolizing law and order and. And, and justice, but they only have the right to basically uphold property rights, defend property rights, and criminalize aggression. Right? Yeah, and, and that's so. The thing then is, they I could mean, they could they could they could use force to compel people to uh, to obey those laws. But basically, you're saying you can use force state the force of the state system to compel people to follow libertarian law, right? Yeah, I mean that and, doesn't mean this, that doesn't mean anything the state does is justified, like a drug war or or or, 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 or uh, extortionate taxation rates or redistribution yeah, of wealth I mean, or state I mean, schools. Honestly, no, I, I don't I don't believe in roads. the drug war because I believe that any, if if someone wants to fucking shoot five pounds of heroin into their body, that's their right to do so. Yeah, that's the every libertarian believes this. This is this is you know. Uh, are you sure you're a minarchist? <laughs> like I said, I, I I believe that if someone wants to shoot five pounds of heroin into their body, they're more that's their right to do so. But why? It's because that action is not invading the borders of anyone else's property. That's why it's not a crime. It's not a crime because it is not a crime. It's not a crime because when I put something into my own body, I'm consenting to it, so I'm not being uh, uh, my rights aren't being violated. I can't violate my own rights. And I am not – by ingesting the substance, I'm not using your property without your permission, which is the only thing that libertarian law prohibits. Libertarian law only prohibits using other people's property without their permission, including their bodies. Right. And I can't use your body, time, and you know, I can't use – say, say, say again? As I said, but at the same time, like I said, you know, I think we can both agree that, mo that most hard drug users – Wind up, you know, doing harm to their community. Part, well, first of all, that's a vague term. It's it's legit. It's it, it, You have the right to do harm. You just don't have the right to 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 commit trespass. If I chop down my rose garden, I'm harming you because I'm lowering the value of your property. But I have the right to do that. If I compete right. with you and I steal your customers, I'm harming you. But I have the right to do that. If I insult Everybody, you, I'm if I insult you, I might be harming you, but I'm I have the right to do that. Right. But it, you know, I'm I'm so what I'm talking about is like, you know, a lot of crime. But but hold on a second. So but these these hard drug users do they do things other than mere harm. They do commit crimes, but right. a large a large part of the reason for that is the drug war has raised prices of these drugs <laughs> so that you have to steal to get enough money. I mean, if they were if it was a free market in drugs, they'd be very cheap. So you wouldn't really need to steal as much. You, you wouldn't need to resort to you know to, to to that. And there wouldn't be an underground, you know, drug kingpin uh, kind of dr drug uh, drug lord thing um, associated with crime. Uh, like the crime would fall drastically, of course, if the drug war was abolished. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I can, I can see that, but at the same time, I mean, I mean, you could, see, by the way, you you could, if you're really going to go down that road, you should, you should be for alcohol prohibition because alcohol is the most dangerous of all the drugs by far, and the, oh, yeah. you know, having alcohol readily available leads to tons of drunk driving and people being killed all the time. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in drunk driving accidents, um, no, I, so and, and so I, might I, as well. I mean, you know, <laughs> having the availability of dangerous resources in the world um, means that the risk that we all face is somewhat increased. But that doesn't mean you can out, you can outlaw these these things. You can't outlaw steel because people can make a sword or a gun with it. You can't outlaw guns because people can misuse them. No, you know, I, you, and I and I agree. And like I said, I just think that, like you said. There's a lot of things that you know that need that need reform, and you know, and but like I said, we're getting off track. You the po the point is, I'm just I'm trying to explain that 
if you understand the nature of patents and copyrights by their nature, even under your reform system, they are essentially negative easements because – or negative servitudes in the civil law. That's what they're called. They, it, it, but they are just simply decreed by the state in response to someone filing a patent application. Right? Someone files a patent – There, someone basically is saying, hey, government, would you please grant me a negative easement over my neighbor's property? And the state doesn't say, well, did he consent to it? The state goes, sure, here you go. <clears throat> so but it's, it, you a, know, I did... it's a non-consensual negative easement, and you can't, you can't justify by saying there's a, a social contract anymore. You can justify the drug war by saying there's a social contract. No, I'm, what I'm what I'm saying is, is you know, we you know we live in 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 this society. Okay, there are things that we get out of this society you know by you know by participating in it you know with with the the ip you know i mean you're saying that you know somebody owns a factory right they can't make that carburetor right that doesn't mean that they can't make wrenches that doesn't mean that they can't make screwdrivers yeah, right. But but it violates their property rights if they're not able to use their property as they want to, and it makes them poorer. If they want to make carburetors, that's their that's their highest valued use for their property, and you're making them go to a second, a, a less valued use. You know, op, there's a, such such a thing in econ, economics is called opportunity cost, right? And not only that, you're making you're harming customers because customers now have to pay higher prices. And have limited supply and reduced oper- reduced uh, choices because they have to go to that one manufacturer now. They're effectively a monopoly. Right. For, for and now, monopolists let's, have let's say, inferior quality products and they have higher prices. No, because like I said, I mean, with the IP, you know, situation where I'm talking about, right? Say you get you say I, I make the carburetor, right? And you get a hold of one of my carburetors, right? And you basically go, oh, I can change this to do this and move that around to there, and I can do this to that. Yeah, but that's but, but – that's, 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 you're basically – you're using a more a less in a, a less efficient design just to get around someone's patent. No, no, that's no, not, no, that's, that's not that's, good. That's not – how do you know it's a less efficient design? Because if, if it was a more efficient design, you wouldn't need to force me not to use your design. I mean I would, I would use a different design anyway. That's what I'm, that's, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. So you get my let's say you get my get a hold of my carburetor, right? Right, you yeah. get a hold of my carburetor and you figure out that if I if you move this to there and that to there and, and change that around to that, right? That's fine, but be- you but I still can't make the exact same carburetor. You're saying I'm prohibited from doing that. What if that's what I want to do? Why do I have then to make a change? Why? In fact, this is horrible. I mean, have you ever tried to <laughs> have you ever had a laser printer? You know, yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, or any kind of printer with a cartridge. Yeah, have you ever noticed that the cartridges, like from Epson and Brother and HP, they're all, they're not they're not they're not interchangeable. They're all different. Right. I mean, sometimes <laughs> sometimes uh, having a similar, you know, you you want you want uniformity sometimes so that parts are interchangeable and that you don't have to keep all these things stocked and you know it might be I mean, nice to go to a harvester go buy a carburetor the standard carburetor that everyone uses instead of having 17 right, different models is, right but it's, it's the same thing with you know uh uh what's it called? i mean with you know with with cars i mean with anything really yeah, and a lot of times these things are different because one company has something so-called proprietary, which whenever you hear proprietary, it means they're using intellectual property to prevent people from mm-hmm. using something similar. I mean uh, fucking uh, Apple sued Samsung for having uh, a, a flat touchscreen yeah, smartphone I, with with rounded corners. I remember that, and that was ridiculous. They're all ridiculous. See, see, this is the thing. They're inherently ridiculous. See, I can I can literally give you thousands of examples of things you would agree are ridiculous, but they're just examples. Yes. Every patent that has ever existed is ridiculous. Everyone. Oh, no. So let me ask you this: What fucking abs? What? 
reason would I have, like I said, to go out and, and spend 20 years and millions of dollars to create, you know, uh, transparent steel, right? If someone can just come along behind me. They can't just yank. come along. By, they can't just come along behind you. It's not easy to compete with other people. Really? Yeah. So you're saying that. What I'm saying is you know, you, whenever you invent a new product, you have some advantage because you're the first to market. And so you can sell it for a higher price than normal in the beginning, and then if it's successful with customers, people will start competing with you either with a similar product or a competing product or the same product, and they will start drawing some of your uh, customers away, and your profit margins will fall, so you can't rest on your laurels, and then uh, you have to keep innovating to stay on top of the market, but then you have reputational effects. I mean… You understand that what, if, if – let's say I invent transparent steel, and I've got okay. this lifetime monopoly that you're in favor of. I don't need okay. to innovate anymore because no one else can make transparent steel. So right. my inno, my inno, oh, hold on. My, my innovation stops because I don't need to keep innovating to stay ahead of the people that are nipping at my heels. And by the same token – by the same token, none of my competitors are innovating as much either because they can't sell transparent steel, so they don't bother to innovate. So the innovation that would come from competitors goes down, and the innovation that comes from the original patent guy goes down. So patent system actually reduces innovation. No, because with the, the patent you know system that I'm that I'm talking about, where you know it's it's for this specific thing, right? This is if, what you'd have if, to if you would ever read an actual patent, you you should actually read an actual patent. I know patent. I have. I, I understand what you're talking. And then you about. would understand what you're proposing makes no sense. It's just not. It's not possible to say specific. I mean, there is a reason that we have a claiming system. It's because it's the only way to implement this patent idea. It's the only way to do it. The patent system was written by all these experts, and they know this is what it means. You have to have experts like me, lawyer, engineer. Guys that talk to the engineers, and they they and they they describe the 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 invention in a certain way that that enables it to someone skilled in a person having ordinary skill in the art of Fuzita, right? And then and then you claim it with a very precise run run on long sentence which describes every functional element of the invention. That's what it means to get a patent. And when you say you would change it to a, the specific embodiment. That's what it is. I mean, that's the way the but system works now. Right, but you, you said earlier that the patents are as broad as can possibly be. They are. And in your system, they would be as broad as possibly – they could possibly oh. be too. Every patent lawyer is going to make – follow the law and the rules of the patent office and try to craft a patent that is as broad as he can get away with. That's why there's 20, 20 or 30 claims in a patent. You start with the broad one, and you go down to the narrow one so that so that – if in court the broad one gets knocked out as being too broad, you can go to the narrow one. Hopefully, the like the narrow claims of the patent are what you're imagining the patent system could be. But all that means is the the broad claim is just narrower than it is now. You still have you would still start with the broadest and go with the narrowest. That's just the way it has to be. But you would, but you would, you, like I said, you would you would get away, get rid of all the broad claims. You, you let me let me say something to you. The way it works is this. To have a patent, you have to define the elements of the thing, right? Right. They're usually functional for, for an apparatus, and they're, they're steps for, <clears throat> for a process or for a procedure. But for an apparatus, it's got a certain set of functional elements that connect to each other in a certain defined way to produce a certain effect, right? That's what, that's what tools and machines are, right? So mm. you have to have someone describe in legally uh, sufficient and technically sufficient language – these things and anything with those elements is that thing that you have a patent right on. Um, now, <clears throat> something emerged in the law called the doctrine of equivalence, and the reason and, – and that is inherent to a patent system. In fact, there's statutory equivalence as well, but the doctrine of equivalence says if someone – let's say a patent – an element has – a patent has four elements, A, B, C, and D, and someone okay. tries to copy my invention… 
but they don't want to get sued for patent infringement. So they take element D and they they tweak it a little bit and they 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 make a tiny change, like um, uh, but this still does the same function. And let's call that D prime. So their 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 product is A, B, C, and D prime. Well, if D is a functional equivalent of of sorry, D prime is a functional equivalent of D. Then they're still infringing under the doctrine of equivalence. Now, I guess you can also say, well, I would get rid of the doctrine of equivalence, but that arose on the com on the the courts came up with that, and the reason they did it was because otherwise you could just make a tiny trivial change to something and get and not in, not not infringe the patent, and then the patent system would be worthless. So it's like that's what I say. You're trying to have it both ways. You're trying to basically. Uh, Take out every bad feature of the patent system that leads to the results you agree are outrageous to avoid those results, which you don't understand would would like would would, would basically neuter the whole patent system, and we would have basically no patent system. But you still want to claim that you would have a patent system. Let, let me put it this way: every patent attorney in every tech company that depends on patents, every patent attorney that's in favor of the patent system, which is ninety nine percent of them, they would all scream bloody murder at your proposal. Because they know they that what you, they know that what you're proposing is effectively get abolishing the patent system. So what you're really in favor of is not really a patent system. What you're in favor of is something like a very narrow design patent or a petty patent. What's called a petty patent in some jurisdictions, uh, except you want it to last for life for some reason. But uh, a design patent is something. Yeah, well, no, it's not for some reason. It's not for some some arbitrary reason. No, but what I mean, okay. yeah, yeah, but it's it's like you. You're trying to blunt the edges, the harsh edges of the natural results of the system that you favor by chopping them all off. But you want to make it – so you want to make it better in most ways, but you want to make it worse by making the term longer. So you're sort of <laughs> you know. The reason the reason why I want to make it – listen, the reason why I want to make the term you know, the life you – know, and like I said, I, and I, I thought I explained that pretty well is the fact that you know, once you know, basically – it is protected for as long as the life as the life of the person who created it exists. It's why it's not transfer. You know, you can't transfer it down to your descendants. You know, that's why the whole idea behind the you know, oh, should we give money to the first person who made coffee? No. I mean, because the descendants of the pers first person who made coffee had nothing to do with it. Yeah. The other problem. With no the, another problem. With, another problem with your life term is that. Competitors will have no idea when they're going to be free to start using the information. That that is that is harm, that is harmful too. It, a, a fixed term, at least a fixed term, they know. Okay, in 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 seven years, I'll will finally be able to do this. They can start gearing up and be ready, but they won't be able to do that when someone. But then, then then wouldn't that wouldn't that improve um, innovation? No. Why not? Well, why why wouldn't taxing me to 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 give a prize or award to the, the the best inventor of the year? Why wouldn't that incentivize innovation? It would incentivize innovation, but it wouldn't be worth it because it has a cost. When you take resources from the public right. in form of taxes, you you reduce the amount of capital they have that they can invest in factories and things. So it's just a shift; it's a redistribution of wealth, and the patent system does that too, except it doesn't do it by taxes. Well, no, because basically with innovation, like I said, with with the with the patent system, at least I'm 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 looking I that I would I think would be a would be a much better one it is simply you know like I said if you create something right and I see that thing and I can go I can make that better if I you know if I make it better you all you you keep assuming there's always an alternative embodiment of an invention there's not if there's not then your your system I mean, like the patent system would literally kill people because it especially in the case of uh pharmaceuticals and um and safety features and, and automobiles and things like that it is it is just pharma, it is it is completely companies. it's a completely outrageous to 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 support any system that would that would that would limit the implementation of life saving technology in vehicles. It's 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 outrageous. It's completely unlibertarian. There, if you if you're supporting a system that results in that, you better rethink what you know. It's like there's something wrong. Something went wrong somewhere. If what you're supporting would actually, you know, kill people.
Mur murder is not what we're supposed to be in favor of as libertarians, you know. I wouldn't say that that's you know. Murder. You ever heard of a? You ever heard of a RSS? You know, like the the technology behind uh, uh, podcasting. You know, really simple syndication. No. Well, that's what RSS I, is. It was invented well, I, by I, a co-invented by a guy named Aaron Swartz. This brilliant young college student. He also helped uh, some other things he came up with too. He was a brilliant young guy. And one mm -hmm. day at uh, – I'm bringing this up because it's not only patents that kill people. Copyright kills people too because um, uh, this guy, Aaron Schwartz, he, he was at Columbia or something like that, and he was one of these kind of information wants to be free kind of guys. So he he downloaded tons of the academic papers. Um, you know, on all behind all these paywalls, like journal articles, and he up and he uploaded all he uploaded thousands of them to the internet from from a computer in a closet at Columbia or somewhere like that. And when he got caught by the feds, he was sued for copyright infringement just for uploading scholarly articles to the internet. And he was facing like I don't know fifty or forty years in federal prison, so he committed suicide. Brilliant guy. Life ended <clears throat> because he was facing a lifetime in federal prison um, for for not violating anyone's rights for uploading articles to the internet. So okay. that's just an example. That's just an example. Copyright kills. Now I guess you say, well, I don't think copyright should have criminal penalties. I don't know why not. If it's if it's trespass, why shouldn't it have criminal penalties? I mean, I don't. I don't think it's like. I, mm, uh, I think maybe you know monetary penalties. Why? Because why it's, should it's, then, it's then why it's either then, a violation anybody, of rights or it's not? Then it's why a, should anybody in the world do anything anymore? Then yeah, but see, your question is first of all, your question is not not well founded. There, there's tons of actually psychological and other studies, and, and his and just history alone shows that people people innovate for lots of reasons, and there's no reason to think. <clears throat> It would so take the take the field of the copyright coverage, which is uh, you know creative works like novels and other books and music and movies. You are aware that piracy is widespread today, right? Oh yes. So there's copyright, the but copyright law thing. copyright law is evaded a billion times a day right now, right? If you yes. come up with if you put out a new movie or um, a new a new a song or a book. Or or images. If you put that out, it's going to be pirated instantly and available on all these pirate sites right away. And that's happening now, right? So yes. we effectively have no copyright right now because it, it can't be enforced. And yet, I, in a world in a world with almost no real copyright, we have more books and more movies and more music than ever. So obviously, people find a way to do it. For either internal reasons or for profit reasons, and make a profit, even though copyright can't be enforced. So how can that because, be? How can that because be? It, because at this time, you know, people still, you know, do buy. You know, they do buy books. They do go to theaters. Of course, they buy books. But because but, here's but, the thing: is, but with, wait, wait, without copyright, they would buy books too. Why do you need copyright to sell a book? Because if you if if you didn't have copyright, right? Yeah, yeah. I could go and take your work. Yeah. Right. And slap my name on it. No one does that. First of all, that's bullshit. That's that's not what copyright protects. Copyright protects me from copying your book and keeping your name on it. It's not about slapping my name on oh, it. Oh, 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 you're saying that's plagiarism. Hold ahead. on. You're saying copyright law, yeah, does not protect if the name. I it's not. It's not about attribution. It protect. It prevents, prevents copying of the work. It has nothing to do with whose name is on it. Hold on. So you're, but, but at the same time, if there was no copyright law, yes, right, I could take Harry Potter, yes, slap my name on it, yes, and start selling it. Who would who would first of all who would buy a book a Harry Potter book with a fake author's name on it because they're going to think well we all know that J.K. Rowling wrote Harry Potter so if if uh, Dennis from from Las Vegas 
says he wrote it, and we know he's lying. What else did he change in the book? I'm not going to buy the book that he might have adulterated. It's just stupid. Listen, do, do you think oh, Romeo and Juliet? Do you think Romeo and Juliet is is is, uh, is protected by copyright? I, no. Do you think Moby Dick is protected by copyright? They're no. all public domain, right? Because they're too old, right? right. Do you think right. you can go on Amazon and find um, Moby Dick written by someone who is not Moby is not Herman Melville? Do you think there are fake copies of Moby Dick out there with fake authors' names on them? Why don't people just slap their name right. on Moby Dick and publish Moby Dick under their name? I'm asking you. I because it doesn't fucking it. happen. So it's a, it doesn't <laughs> happen. It would not happen. It doesn't happen. Cop, copyright has nothing to do with the fact that people I maybe don't, maybe not with great maybe not with great works. Okay, let's let's take the great works out. Not with the, not with any work that is already published and people already know who the author is. Once you know right. someone is 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 lying about their name, you're not going to want to to waste time reading through the book well, because they might right, have changed right. something else in it. But let's say let's say it's you know, um, I've been reading, you know, um, hold on, give me two seconds here. Grab my Kindle. Um, I've been reading the the Freehold series. If you know, um. I've heard, vaguely heard of name? it. What about it? Um, damn it! Get back there. I think we should close up, wrap it up in a little bit too. In two hours. All right, uh, Michael Z. Williams. All right, not a well-known author. Right. Yeah, but his his authorship of this series is apparently public fact by now. People people know who wrote it. It's a right. It's, it's been I mean, published. What I'm saying it, but right, it has been okay. If someone copies that think... book and they they copy the book and start selling it, then someone's going to finally realize that hey, the exact same book was already published several years ago by another author. So this right, guy's fucking lying. Already, right, but by that time they've already bought the book. Who they've cares? So what? I'm sure Michael G. Williams would 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 care. Where are they going to buy the book from? Amazon. Why would why uh, would Amazon Kindle. why would Amazon want to put uh, plagiarized books on its site and get a bad reputation for not offering good good books? Maybe wouldn't wouldn't make... Amazon wouldn't Amazon take it down as soon as they found out that the guy's lying? If you, if you go to if you go to Kroger and you buy toothpaste, how do you you buy Crest toothpaste? How do you know it wasn't fake to Crest made in China? Do you think Kroger exactly. would do you think Kroger would sell fake crest toothpaste made in China and and take the risk that someone's going to find out and then they're going to lose their customers cuz you know what I mean it's just not it's a non problem. Let me ask you this. Do, do you think you could go buy a copy of, of of Moby Dick right now if you wanted to? Could I go buy a copy of Moby Dick if I wanted to? Yeah. Oh well, yeah. Well, how can that be? It's not under copyright. Why would anyone have an incentive to sell the book? How is it possible to sell a book that's not copyright? When you read my book, did you read a paper copy or did you read an on uh, online copy? I read it uh, off of uh, Mises.org. Well, they, they sell paper copies. Amazon sells paper PDF. copies. I don't have a copyright. I, 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 it's, it's, it's in public domain. Guess what? A few right. people a few people have translated my book without my permission. Well, I gave them permission because I put a CC license on it. Right. That didn't hurt me. Some people have some some guy took it and he he published a, a um a, a large text print, a large print version for you know uh, people that can't read well on paper. Yeah, he sells it. I don't and care. You I'm don't care. Fuck. Not only not only do I not care, I I thanked him and I gave him permission okay. by putting a CC license in it. Okay, I mean, I mean but and, I'm, and guess I'm, what? My book still sells. So what? Okay, but you're missing out on those sales. Really? I was going to do a large print version for the blind. I was going to translate it into Romanian. And you don't think that? And I don't. Anyway, work? I don't have a right to those sales. No one has a right to sales. And anyway, I'm not doing any profit, so I don't give a fuck. But right. and you're not doing it for profit, but some, you know, but other people, other people do. Yeah. So, you know. so so let, let's let's take an example. Imagine imagine a copyright free world, that is a freer world than we have now. And mm -hmm. J.K. Rowling is uh, 
some kind of welfare mom who's writing these books in her spare time on her which train she rides, which she did. And she writes Harry Potter, has no idea it's going to be a big seller, which she didn't. And let's say she goes to a couple of publishers, and they're not interested, so she goes, oh, I'll just self-publish it. So, so let's say she puts it on Amazon, which you can do right now, mm -hmm. but there's no copyright. So, now, by, by the way, just because there's no copyright doesn't mean everything's going to be pirated because – People, you don't pirate everything that's out there. Like, I, I, I'm not pirating. Right, Moby you pirate Dick things right now. good. Yeah, so you have to wait. To, when new books come out, you have to wait and see which ones are successful to see which ones are worth pirating, right? And so, when you wait, that means there's an initial period of time where the the or, or the original author is has basically a semi monopoly for a while, so they can sell it for a reasonable price for a while until people realize, oh, I need to get it on this game. But anyway, so Harry Potter puts. Uh, uh, Rowling puts Harry Potter number one up on the um, on Amazon, and it starts selling a lot on Kindle mm. and paper copies. So she, let's say she makes a million dollars, and there's millions of kids around the world who love it. And then right away, um, pirate copies are going to start appearing, right? Like online and paper copies by you know guys in India and China. So her profits drop precipitously, let's say, although some people would still buy from her because they know they're getting the authentic original book, right? But let's say her some sales care drop. About that. So what's that? Some people care about that. Some do, some don't. So some people pay twice as much for Tyler <clears> and <throat> as, they, as, they, as they do for the generic acetaminophen, right, even though it's twice as much and sitting yeah. right next to it. Some people care about <laughs> reputation and all that. Anyway, right. so her sale let's say her, let's say she makes a million dollars and then her sales go away. Well then, guess what? Now she has she knows she has like ten million fans around the world. So she 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 puts on her website, "Hey, Harry Potter number two has just been completed. I'm going to release it on Amazon as soon as I get ten million advance orders for ten dollars each." Okay, so she gets a hundred million dollars in pre-orders. Then she sells it, and then she starts getting pirated right away. So she makes ten million, and that's she makes a hundred million, and that's it. Well, now she's got a hundred one million, right? And then she does that with the other five books, and she's up to like half a billion dollars, right, without copyright. And then, because there's no copyright, no one needs her permission to make a movie. So someone starts three 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 movie three movie studios start making um, a, a pirated movie version of the first novel. But one of them, okay. one of them approaches Rowling and they say, "Hey, listen, we're going to make a Harry Potter movie, but if if you will consult on it and give it your official approval, we will give you ten percent of the box office receipts, and then we can tell all the all your fans out there that there's three mm -hmm. movies coming out, but ours is the one that you endorse. So we'll get more, we'll sell more tickets than the other guys because um, your fans would prefer to see the authorized version of the movie." Right, one that you had an input in the creative process. So the movie makes you know three hundred million dollars, and she gets thirty million in consulting fees. Mm -hmm. Right, so now we're up to you know five hundred and thirty-one billion a million dollars. She's half a billion. Right, so, I mean, so, the so, point is, it's possible in a copyright-free world to sell shit and to make money. <laughs> I, it it is, I, you know, but at the same time, with those three those three movies, right? Let's say those, you know. Those three studios, because of copyright law, mm. each had to give J.K. Rowling. No, money no, 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 no. Or, if there's, under copyright, or, there would only be one studio. In the copyright, there would only be one because she would only I, sell the rights to one company. Okay, that's, yeah. I mean, that's why we had the. Have you we, ever seen yeah, the, the shitty not. Atlas Shrugged movies? By the way, have you ever seen that? Oh okay, God, yeah. You know why it's so shitty? Because the estate of Ayn Rand would not grant permission to anyone until, until you know that time. But if, if there had been no copyright, someone by now might have made a good Atlas Shrug movie. But they had to get permission of the fucking estate. And you know, if someone could just well, do what they well, wanted, also, but that's the thing though is, okay, <laughs> there might have been a good Atlas Shrug without copyright. Right, but there that's that's the thing though is. Is maybe they didn't give permission because they saw that what they were doing with it and said, "Fuck no, I'm not going to allow Ayn Rand's you know name to be put on that." No, they didn't give permission because they're control freaks and 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 they uh, and and they want it to be done a certain way because they wanted maybe that's that's why they're shitty. 
you know, Atlas Shrugged movies. I'm just saying that we don't know. We don't know what would have happened without copyright, but other people could have tried, and maybe there were a big good one. And right. if we wouldn't have had to wait in a, we, we wouldn't, have, wouldn't have had to wait 50 fucking years. <laughs> or no, it was yeah. longer than that, right? Atlas Shrugged was 56, and the movie came out, what, 2010? So like 60? It's crazy. 60, 60 years, yeah. Crazy. But, in, but, but you know, uh, wait, when, it, when did Ayn Rand die? 1982. Oh, shit. So that's what, another 40 years? Until someone can make a... Yeah. Leonard but, I mean, Peacock. If, Leonard Peacock I mean, owns all that. But that's the thing, though, is, just, and I mean, <clears throat> they still made an Atlas Shrug movie. Even with copyright law. I know. And it sucked. <laughs> what what would have been any, what would have been any different if they would have I mean they they got the books. I don't know. Why don't we why don't we try a free market and see? How about that? <laughs> How about that crazy idea? That's like you know, I you hear. sound like you sound like a, a fucking Russian who says uh um uh uh I don't want I don't want to uh privatize the the market because how ha- how many brands of toothpaste would there be? Right now, we go to the government store, and there's one brand of toothpaste. How many brands would there be in your system? I don't fucking know how many brands of toothpaste there would be. <laughs> there might be seven. I don't know. Yeah. So what? And, 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 and I'm sure you understand. I I don't believe in you know in centralized you know shit like that, like you know, like like communism or socialism or anything like that. But you, but you, but it, but you keep asking the question, what would freedom look like? And the government has distorted it and made it impossible to know. But we can have some guesses. But it's like you want to guarantee. It's like, it's, it's like you're saying, it's like the it's like the the welfare liberal. If we say you libertarians want to get rid of welfare and replace it with charity, but can you guarantee that there would be enough charity for every poor person? It's like. And if I say, well, I can't guarantee it because it's not a right, we'll say, well, then we're going to keep our we're going to keep our welfare system, you know. Right. And, 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 and by the way, if I, and my, the answer is, well, you can't guarantee your welfare system is going to be around forever either because it's fucking bankrupt, you moron. You know, <laughs> Social Security is bankrupt. It's going to everyone knows it's not going to be around in twenty years for for us when we retire. Um, and uh, right. and you're well, doing well, you're doing the same thing because they, they keep stealing from it. <laughs> so your 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 assumption is that the patent system. Incentivizes innovation, which is false. It does not. In my in my view, it actually impedes innovation. And number two, I already already gave examples the of how system it is now. It, it yeah, and, and your patent system would incentivize innovation. Um, would impede innovation maybe less, although it could be more because it lasts longer. So I, I don't I don't know if you're um because it's better in that the claims are narrower. But it's worse yeah. in that it lasts longer. So I, I'm not sure if it's better or worse on balance. But um, okay. but what you're saying is you assume that the patents help innovation now, and if you got rid of patents, there would be almost no innovation, or significantly less innovation. <sighs> um, because why, why are people gonna why are people gonna put fucking and 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 you're and, and when I say there would be innovation, you you want you're demanding answers, just like the communist says. How many brands of toothpaste would there be? Or, or, or the welfare liberal who says you need to guarantee that charity would be enough to replace the welfare system. You want to guarantee that in a free market there's an opt, a, a, enough innovation. So you are a central planner to a degree because you think – what you're doing is what the Chicago types do like Richard Epstein. Basically, you have a market failure argument. You're generally in favor of the free market, but you think sometimes it breaks down. In fact, you, you have to believe that because you're a minarchist, so you think that the free market – breaks down for law and order and security. That's why you favor the state because you think there's a public good there and there has to be a state, right? So all you minarchists believe in, in market failure to some degree. You just think there has to be a state for certain things the market can't provide, right? That's why you're not an anarchist. But you also believe that okay. um, you also believe that in a free market, let's say we have a minarchist free market where you have a, a minimal go- government just stopping uh, theft and murder, right? That's all it does <clears throat> and protecting property rights. That's all it does. Um, with their army, well, that's just how you stop, stop theft and murder. It, it, that's the thing is that's that's one of the well the fallacies is it yeah. doesn't stop nothing stops theft and murder except for 
the person, the victim. Well, they they help they help to enforce rights by trying to minimize rights violations by having police, by right. having an army, military, and by having uh, courts that can redress things after they happen to try to dissuade right. that kind of stuff, right? And and anyway, it never stops. It only punishes it. Well, but when you punish it, you disincentivize people doing it in the future. So True. they're trying to reduce the, the rate of it, right? So what you're saying is in a free market without patents, people wouldn't invent as much as I think they should invent because some 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 would be inventors would be af would be afraid to enga engage in the research and development because they think that um, th they fear being having competitors compete with them too quickly for them to make enough monopoly profits to recoup their cost. So they would never engage in that innovation in the first place. So so in a free market, there's a market failure because the possibility of of copying and emulation and competition reduce, results in a suboptimal amount of innovation. And we can intervene with the government to fix that market failure by granting these temporary monopolies to the inventors to give them protection from competition so they can make more monopoly profit after – which hurts the consumer because they're paying a higher price, and it reduces innovation in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the sometimes, but it, it makes more innovation happen. So you, you think there's a market failure, and the government can come in and, and fix it. So that is a market failure argument. That is the same thing that you know statists and socialists argue all the time for all the interventions, all the interventions they favor, like education and roads and post office. Right. And, 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 and hence why, hence, hence again, why I'm a minarchist, not a yeah. Anarchist. But minarchists, minarchists only believe in a narrow set of market failure. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is, you don't have to be an anarchist like me to be against intellectual property. There, there are several independent reasons to be against intellectual property. Number one, it's legislation and. Libertarians should oppose legislation as a way of making law. We should only be in favor of the common law, and patent and copyright cannot come up, uh, cannot emerge on the common law. It's a statutory scheme. Number two, um, it it, it uh, uh, the utilitarian argument, which is kind of what you're trying to make, it, it, it is not is not uh, ever been proven to be true. There's no evidence that's ever shown that the patent system has re has benefited the country at all or has reduced. Uh, in, Re resulted in, in. I don't think it's. I don't think it's. It's possible to be proven. That's correct. Which mean, that's correct. Which means it's a market intervention, which is based upon your assumption that it does improve innovation, but you can never prove it. So you can never meet your burden of proof. But you can also never disprove it either. <laughs> the point is, you can't. I don't have the burden of proof. You're 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 saying the government should grant uh, intrusions into the free market and protect people <clears> from competition <throat> they would normally face. Which violates their property rights, and you're saying it's justified because it, it produces more innovation. Okay, well you have to prove that. You've never proven it. No study's ever proven it, and there are studies that that indicate that it it impedes innovation, but they're all guesses basically. Everything we're doing right now is guesses. You're guessing that you're guessing that uh, that no, you know, no patent laws would improve innovation and would would stimulate the market, you know, and so on and so forth. It's, a, it's a pretty it's that. a pretty informed guess, <laughs> and not only that, that's not my main argument. My main argument is, is that it's, it's unjust; it violates property rights. You know, it's it's the same okay. argument that libertarians have against antitrust law and the minimum wage. Like the the primary argument against the minimum wage is that it violates property rights, and the primary argument against antitrust law is it violates rights because it 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 uses the force of law to to harm people for doing something that doesn't violate rights. And we should be able to free to do anything that doesn't violate rights. And offering someone a dollar an hour for a job doesn't violate its rights. And colluding with a businessman to set prices doesn't violate any consumer's rights because they don't have a right to any given price. right? Secondarily, we can say – and we also think that a minimum wage law is harmful, and it's not necessary. And we can say that antitrust laws uh, really – are harmful to the economy and are not necessary, and that there would be no real monopolies on a free market even without antitrust law. But that's a second, that's a fallback argument. It's not the primary argument. Just like for me, intellectual property is primarily a matter of justice. It's once you understand the nature of our property rights and where they come from, how they're what their function is, you'll see that uh, IP rights uh, are, in, are are contrary to that, and they un, they violate property rights. You, basically, you should not be able to prevent someone from. From, from copying information that you make public.
if you if you want if you want to keep your ideas to yourself, keep them to yourself. Okay, so then, so you know, in that in that particular sense, you know, if you did that, you know, kept everybody, you know, you'd have to do everything behind fences. No, you, you could. Know. No, you, the point is, you can't keep things secret. Sometimes, I mean, it's it's not possible for most inventions to be kept secret if you want to sell the product, because most most products with an innovative feature. The innovative feature is pretty apparent or can be reverse engineered. So you have a choice to you have a choice when you come up with a new invention. If you want to be able to sell it, then the price you're paying is that you're telling people how to compete with you. And if right. you don't want to do and, that, don't do it. And here's the thing: is like, like I was reading in your your article uh, about you know the you know IP's contracts and stuff like that. Yeah. You know where you know a writes a book and sells yeah. physical copies to numerous yeah. purchasers. With a contractual condition that each buyer, be, yeah. you know, is obligated not to make it or sell or a copy. That was of the text. That, that was Roth. That was Rothbard's uh, attempt to justify a version of copyright. Yeah, and patent. Yeah, right. But you know, in in that situation, yeah, that would become massively burdensome because each person, you know, to buy a physical copy of the book would have to then sign a contract. I agree. You know, it's, to, I agree. It's, it's it's I agree. But that's a, that. That's an argument that the people – some people say that patents and copyrights are justified because they're they're really contractual, or they'll say you could do it by contract, and this is just a more efficient way of doing that. But the fact that you could never do it by contract shows that it's, it's not a form of contract. You could. You could technically do it by contract. No, you couldn't. No, you couldn't because you couldn't bind third parties. You could only bind your customers. Right. Contracts only bind the parties to the contract. Exactly. So if, if I sell so, you a book and I, I make you promise not to copy it, but you uh -huh. copy it, you copy it anyway, and you put the you put the you put the copy online on the internet and it, where, where mm -hmm. everyone in the world can see it, those people are free to download that information because they never signed a contract with the seller. But when but then basically you're putting, you know, wouldn't the author then be able to go after buyer you know the buyer yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. for damages yes for every single <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah but some guy that bought a book for five dollars is not going to have a billion dollars in damages dude but you know and then then there comes in the you know and by the and by the way by the way the fact that by me buying a book from you means you might sue me for millions of dollars means i'm not going to buy the book from you i'm not going to Take that risk. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to get a pirated copy of the book. So no one is going. No one's going to. Then, no one's going to take that risk in buying a fucking book. So from what someone. happens? What happens if every every author? Yeah. Because there is no copyright laws. Yeah. Every single author now requires a contract for someone to buy their book. Then, then they would. They would they would sell less books than they otherwise would because they're look it's hard enough to find a customer willing to part hand over some of their money to buy your book and now you're make you're adding a cost you're you're making them sign a contract mm -hmm. and take on some liability so if you could sell a book for ten dollars without restrictions if you add restrictions to it now you can maybe only sell it for eight dollars so you're reducing your profits and you're re and you're reducing the sales too because fewer people are going to to buy it under those conditions so you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Which is why no, because, not every because, author would do it. Some authors would say, "Hey, come, come to me." I, I, you know, it's like I don't know. Have you ever seen um, Louis C.K.? You could go on his website and you can buy one of his like comedy shows for five five dollars, and he just gives you the PD. He just gives you the MP, the MP three file or the or the movie file. You just download it. He doesn't. All right. He don't sign a fucking contract. Now, of course, there's copyright law, so he doesn't need uh, to sign a contract. Uh -huh. but, but he doesn't put D, he doesn't put D, he doesn't put DRM in it. He doesn't make you sign anything. He just sells it to you, and people buy it. If he was selling for a hundred dollars and asking you to sign some contract with an arbitration clause, no yeah. one would do that. But they, but they would. They would pirate it. No, they would. If they, you know, if everybody was doing it. That's the thing is, is if everybody did it, right? If every author demanded that their customers sign this ag agreement, and the agreement and the agreement made the agreement made every customer agree to um, a universal convention that said you have to respect 
the private equivalent of copyright in every author's books. Yes, that that could be that could that would be legitimate, and but it still wouldn't be copyright. It would be a private uh, a private attempt to simulate it, but it's totally unworkable. But it would be it would be, it would be exactly exactly. Well, I, I'm, people are free to try. But that's the thing is that's why the whole copyright the whole copyright thing exists is because the other way is so massively burdensome to not only the author but also the consumer. Yeah, but yeah, but, but that's like saying that uh, uh, you know um, on a free market, maybe we wouldn't have landed on the moon in 1969 because who's going to waste billions of dollars for no purpose whatsoever? So we need to have a government to have NASA. That's because that's the only way we're no, going to get on the moon. The reason, In other words, I mean, you're well, you're assuming you're assuming that the goal is to get on the moon. I thought the goal was property rights and justice and freedom and prosperity. But here's the thing, though: is, is what do we have right friggin' now? Patent law. No, SpaceX. Yeah, but we landed on the moon in 1969. I don't think we would right. have had private industry land on the moon in '69. Uh, no, because they, they, we we didn't look at it as a as a priority. It should not have been a priority. It's ridiculous. It's a waste of money. What are you talking about? Well, or does your minarchy have... does your minarchy include NASA too? No. Good good man. No. All right. I think we I think we've exhausted this enough. I, I think I think you I think you can agree with me that I'm right and that you 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 concede your case against IP. No. No. <laughs> you knew you knew that was not gonna happen. It happens sometimes. I've made a lot of converts. No, I, like I said, I, I I'll, think I'll, I'll thing, give I, I'll I, give you I'll give you six months. You'll you'll come around. No, because here's the thing: is like I said, I think the IP system as it is right now is is the same with any fucking government is massively overbloated. You know, is you know, I think the IP system as it is now does strangle innovation. Because it's too broad, it doesn't, you know, it basically, you know, like you said, you know, if someone takes a stool and creates a patent for a stool, if someone creates a fucking chair, you know, that is, you know, completely different than the stool, then the patent person with the patent with the stool can then come and sue them, even though they created something absolutely different than a fucking stool. Well, if you think the patent system right now... Uh, impedes innovation. Why wouldn't you prefer to have no patent system to the one we have because, now? Because I, I think that no patent system would impede it more. So you think the the current patent system impedes innovation relative to what Dennis's made up patent system would would do? Yes. Okay. I think that if, you know if we narrow the focus of patents. Made them, more, you know, it's just like with uh, with drug companies. You know, a patent expires. They change the formula a little bit and create a new fucking patent. Look, okay, all libertarians are entitled to one deviation, so I'll allow you this one. You don't have any others, do you? I don't think so. No. Okay. You know, I, I just like I said, my my big thing is is with you know, I believe that in the idea that you know someone's labor of you know of, of their mind should be just as protected as the labor of their hands you know i understand you know a lot of libertarians it's all about physical property i, I think that uh, uh, the, the thing is the, the mind, thing is you can't have both that's the problem you can't have both if you believe in physical <laughs> property rights which you do then you can't have the other because it, it's it's like having positive welfare rights and negative rights. You can't have both. One one comes at the expense of the other. Hey, let me ask you a question. Do you happen to know Adam no. Hallman? No. Uh, he's in Las Vegas. He's a Libertarian Party guy. Uh, hey, wait, Adam Hallman, H A M A N. Oh yeah, yeah. Hayman, Hayman, Hallman. Yeah. And his wife. Jane. Adam Hayman. Yeah. 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 No, I know Adam. Yeah. He's a good guy. Yes, he is. No, I, uh, you know, I was actually a delegate. I was a little alternate at the lost at the uh, the Reno convention. Oh, I was there too. Yeah, so I was there. I was the one that was running. I don't know if you if you saw me, but I was the one that was running around on the little fucking on the little fucking scooter. 
excuse my language. I don't remember. Yeah. I threw my back out and <laughs> had to <laughs> rent one of those little, you know, hover around scooter things. Are you in the ca Mises caucus? Yes. Oh, good man. Good man. I, mean, I don't know if you see the. Oh, okay, cool. All right, well, let me let you run. Yeah. We can chat later. Yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, and like I said, I mean, I think I, I, you know, I just think it's one of this is one of those impasses where, you know, both of us believe something passionately. Um, you know, like I said, I I went to the the trouble of of, you know, reading your uh, yeah, yeah I'll give you that your your article and you know I had a lot of people of course in that thread going. Read this article. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least, at least you got to read up on it. Hey, do you know what the difference is between an anarchist, uh, a minarchist, and an anarchist? What's that? About six months. <laughs> Same thing between you know what's the difference between the conspiracy theory and the truth? What? About six months. <laughs> <laughs> at least in this in this in this day and age, anyways. Yeah. But no, all right, man. Hang just, in there. Have a good one. Yeah, no. I, so I, 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 I'll have to say, I, I enjoyed the conversation. I, I enjoyed the, you know, the, the mental, you know, uh, exercise. Um, like I said, I just think we both believe in something passionately and it's, it's something that we, you know, just, I, you know, one of those agree to disagree things. Well, if you talk to if you see Adam Heyman or in your other buddies in the caucus, uh, run this by them. You, you, you'll 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 start getting. Oh besieged. no, I already. I, yeah, I trust me. There's there's plenty of of just pure anarchists, you know, in the Las Vegas, you know, libertarian area. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm one of like I said, I'm one of the the, the holdout minarchists. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck. All right. You take care, sir. See ya. Yeah, thank you. Bye.